In the year 2100, research on humanity's lifespan has skyrocketed, and due to this, a fitness craze has started, as humanity started to become obsessed with their youth. That was also the time when the holographic game, God's Domain, came into existence. The game functioned by simulating the player's real-life movements, which was a revolutionary mechanic that allowed it to become the most played game in the entire world. As such, many workshops for the game have also started to appear, and the stock prices of the financial groups that are backing those workshops grew as well. The years went on and on, and in the year 2139, this advanced even further. The story begins at the Shadow Workshop, where the protagonist, Shi Feng, is fired. He is extremely hurt by this, as he has sacrificed tons of things for this game and made the Shadow Workshop what it is today, with La Hua also becoming a world-class financial group thanks to him. However, even after all of that, they dare delete his account and fire him, solely because he is against them merging with other guilds? The man who threw the papers at him smiles and explains that he will get 5 million credit points and a mansion, which should be enough for him to live a comfortable life from now on. Like what a great philosopher once said, one should be content with his lot. Without any other choice, Feng accepts their offer, but he is still extremely distraught, as he has built an entire empire. But now, it was taken away from him solely because they thought he was a liability. He will not let it slide. Are they really considering him a beggar? He will show them who he is, even if he has to start from scratch. Suddenly he falls asleep, and a certain ringtone wakes him up. So he picks up, as his friend Hei Zi is calling him. He explains that the Shadow Workshop is recruiting at their school today, which makes Feng think that this is a prank, something which his friend used to do a lot. However, that is when Feng looks at his mirror and notices something that shocks him. He has become young once again, and when he looks at the time on the phone, he notices that it's the year 2129. He has gone back 10 years. With that revelation, he goes outside to meet with his friend and thinks that he would have never expected for the great heavens to give him a second chance. But now, he will have his revenge on Shadow and on anyone who dared to betray him. Hei arrives at their meeting spot and notes that they should go sign up already, as there's probably already tons of people there. Fong stops him though and asks, if he were to not want to join Shadow and plan on starting his own workshop, would he join? He thinks that in the following years, Hei's managerial abilities will start to show so he will be great in helping grow a workshop. Originally, Hei joined Shadow in order to support his family financially, so if that is his objective, he is sure to change his mind. Hei says that it's expensive to start a workshop, as even without the employees and their salaries, they would still need 80,000. Feng tells him that he is correct, but signing a contract with Shadow is equal to selling their souls. He does not want to be controlled by the likes of them ever again. Hei agrees that having their own workshop would be nice, but even if they put all of their money together, they won't be able to afford a single set of equipment. Feng then pulls him closer and explains that he should not worry about equipment, as God's domain gives university students like them discounts, so they will use that and try the game out in 10 days. Hei wonders what they will be able to do in 10 short days, but Feng feels that it is plenty. He will manage the money anyways, so all he needs to do is relax for now. After this, he goes to shop for necessities and eventually picks up his headset, which is basic from what he used to have. But for now, this is more than enough. He puts the headset on, equips his gloves, and logs in God's domain for the first time in this life. He is logged in successfully and walks a set of stairs towards a structure, and a wave of nostalgia hits him as he has forgotten what the old login pages looked like. It was really simple. Suddenly, an angel appears out of nowhere and explains that she will help him navigate the menus. First though, he must pick a job, with 12 available. He has tons of choices, so he should make his choice now. Feng picks Swordsman, as this is what he had before too, and the angel asks him to create a name and avatar. Feng thinks that it will be okay to use the same name, but he will alter his appearance, as he doesn't want others to recognize him. The final part of the setup is to choose a birthplace in the Star Moon Kingdom, and Feng selects the White River City, as it's the fifth largest in the kingdom, and it's a great location for avoiding guild fights also, allowing him to level up whilst also keeping a low profile. After he is done, the angel transports him to the game world, but not before wishing him good luck. A ray of light engulfs Feng, and he arrives in a place called Redleaf Town, apparently a place he has been to before. Here, it can be seen just how active the game is, 
with tons of players gathering and doing quests. Fung checks his stats and finds that he has four free attribute points, which is a given, as a player is given four points upon leveling up, thus allowing them to build however they want. However, most people choose simply. If their role deals physical damage, they will prioritize strength. He did the same in his past life too. However, this time, he knows that agility is the way to go early, as he can do jobs much quicker this way. Agility raises one's movement and attack speed, so it's great to start with this attribute, but players will not find this out for a long time. Suddenly, he gets a call from Black Cloud, which is Hay, who explains that he chose the Cursemancer class and transported to Moonfall Town. Fung urges him to come to Redleaf Town, where he is, as he will help him with leveling up. But Hay is hesitant, as it will take him seven hours to reach, and everyone is already leveling up. Won't he be left out? Fung explains that it doesn't matter, as with their goal in mind, to get enough funds to start the workshop, leveling up frantically, like everyone else is doing, isn't ideal. He also asks if he knows what a unique quest is, and Hay's eyes light up as he hears those words, as those are epic quests, and are called unique only because there is one in the entire server. Once it's done, it's gone for good. The rewards are also plentiful, so it's worth the effort. Fung arrives in a rundown part of town where only beggars reside, who immediately try to steal from him, but once he pulls out his sword, they calm down. He explains to Hay that there is a unique quest in this town. Hearing this, does he still want to level up in Moonfall Town? Hay is still unconvinced by this, as it will take him a lot of time to get there, but he also asks, how does he know so much? Is he perhaps in contact with one of the beta testers? Fung doesn't answer his question, and tells him once again to get to Redleaf Town, as after he's done with the quest, he will help him level up and he promises that he will be able to level up much faster than normal players ever could. After their call is done, he approaches a specific beggar and asks if he needs anything. The beggar naturally asks for food, as he has not eaten in days, but Fung cannot fulfill his request. So he asks, does he have any other requests? There are many things he would do, for the right price of course. It seems that these are the keywords that activate the quest, as the beggar asks him to kill the mayor of Redleaf Town, Cross. Suddenly, a system pop-up appears in front of Fung, where it presents him with a choice. Does he accept the unique quest? Fung naturally chooses yes, as this is what he came here for. Next up, he goes to the town hall and waits in line for the mayor's quest, as it is common etiquette to wait in line. Fung analyzes his stats, 2,400 GP and 1,500 mana. With his current level, he will not be able to defeat the mayor even if there were hundreds of him as this guy is just too powerful. However, that does not stop Fung, as he throws the tomato he was eating straight into the mayor's face, which naturally angers him, and so he jumps Fung, who seems to have a trick up his sleeve. Fifteen minutes before this, when Fung first approached the town hall, he noticed just how far the queue line for the mayor's quest is, so now he feels kind of bad that he has to kill him. Fung continued to walk right next to the queue line, but that's when one of the players noticed him, and told him to go back, if he doesn't want to become enemy number one to every player that is waiting. Fen smiles, and thanks him for the advice, but he shouldn't worry, as he's not here for the mayor's mission. But he also shouldn't be here, as there are tons of other missions that are better than this one elsewhere. The player thinks otherwise, as there are tons of other players waiting so it must be good. He should stop trying to fool others like this, but Fung promises it's not to fool him, as he will give him a hint too. He should go and hunt monsters in the wilds, as it's more beneficial for him, rather than waiting in a line. The player notes that the wilds are filled with players, so the competition for mobs is quite fierce. He would rather wait here, than go through that pain. Fung explains that he should go to areas with fewer monsters if that is the case, as the monsters will spawn slower, and with nobody having any patience these days, not a soul will be there. So it's a free XP farm for him. The player is quite glad to hear this, and asks him to tell him about this spot too, if he knows where he is. For this information though, Fung asks for 20 copper coins, but the player refuses, as they all start with 10 copper coins anyway. Seeing that the player is hesitant, Fung offers him a deal. He gives him the 10 copper coins, and he will send him the location. However, if what he said is true, and he is able to easily level up, he will give him another 10 coins. He told him all of this because he saw greatness in him, but if he doesn't want to, he can just forget about it. 
The player reluctantly gives the coins, and after the transaction is done, Fung goes to buy 10 tomatoes with the money he earned. This catches the eyes of two female players who laugh at him, as they both think he is a fool. Why would anyone spend their starting money on that? After that, Fung went to the mayor and threw the tomato in his face, while also calling him tons of bad names, in hopes to anger him further. His tomato assault continued, which made the other players waiting for the quest quite scared, as they never expected to see such a maniac so early on. Naturally, after such a shameful display, the mayor regards Fung as an enemy, and in a split second, charges in, almost killing Fung, who is now quite low on HP. The other players watch in amazement, as he shouldn't have been able to survive that, but that's when the mayor's face slowly morphs, and he suddenly becomes a werewolf. He charges Fung once again, but before he can reach him, the town guards intervene, as werewolves are considered evil, so it's their job to protect the town. Fung was aiming for this, but he needed to do it with tomatoes because they deal no damage. As if he did damage to the mayor, the guards would have also attacked him. But now, since the mayor has turned into a dark creature, the guards are programmed to kill him. The players, seeing this as an opportunity, also charge in, and notes of attacks are unleashed on the mayor until he eventually dies. Unfortunately for the players, the mayor did not drop a single item, or he did, but Fung took it, and he's long gone. After Fung gives the beggar his request, he thanks him from the bottom of his heart and presents him with an item that he hopes will help him in his journeys. Additionally, Fung gains 2,000 XP, 20 free mastery points, and a luxurious accessory box. He is quite surprised by this, as he did not expect such a generous reward, and chooses to open the accessory box right now, which upon opening, lights up the entire alley. The item Fung has gained from this is the Ring of Gravity, that despite the stat boosts it gives, also gives a skill, Gravity Unbound, which makes the user's body as light as a feather. Fung is extremely glad that this item fell into his hands, and decides to continue dumbing points in the agility stat. With that, his abilities will be comparable to that of an assassin. He also gains a level up on his swordsmanship, which increases his damage dealt. With this over, Fung decides to go to the Goblin Challenge, in order to obtain a skill book. When he arrives, he notices a few guys trying their hardest to complete the challenge, but to no avail, as their leader fails again and again. He asks them for more money, but they have already given him everything. They are also calling him by a certain name, Heartstabber. Fung knows this name, as this guy will become one of the top 10 assassins in the Star Moon Kingdom, but he really did not expect him to be such a weak man, so early into his journey. Suddenly, he spots Fung, and asks him for five copper coins, as he will return it by tomorrow, with interest. With their guild being so powerful, he can also offer him an invitation. Fung accepts the offer, however, he wants 50 copper in return, which angers Heartstabber's minions, as this is downright disrespectful to their great master. Fung asks if he still wants to do the deal, and Heartstabber agrees, which makes Fung happy, as it seems it's very easy to make money around these parts. The minions ask if they have to pay him back, but Heartstabber wants to, as he's the leader of a guild, and surely today he will be able to pass the goblin test. The minions agree although with a heavy heart. While analyzing the goblin, they notice that Fung is also taking on the challenge, which makes them laugh, as he is just a newbie, and he will get destroyed by the ever-changing attack of the goblins. Even Heartstabber only managed to reach 20 yards before being shot down. Fung gets ready, and at the count of three, the challenge starts, with him running as fast as he possibly can the moment it does so. The goblins begin their reign of bullets, but Fung swiftly dodges them, and goes through bullets without a single one hitting him. One of the minions is amazed, as he's extremely fast and avoids attacks. He might actually be able to defeat their boss. Heartstabber notes that he might be an athlete or a martial artist, that is why he's more agile, and the other minion bashes the one who dared to insult their master. Heartstabber thinks that this guy is definitely not ordinary. In any way, however, the pattern of the goblin's attack will change at the 15-yard mark, so he will have to face death like he did time and time again. Eventually, Fung reaches the 15-yard mark, and the goblins pull out some chain pistols and begin unleashing hell on Fung in the form of bullets, but he dodges them and thinks that this time, it's his turn to cheat. While he prepares to defend himself, the minions laugh at him 
as if he gets hit by a single bullet, it means that he failed. So even with his sword, he cannot defend himself against so many bullets. However, when the bullets reach Fung, he expertly hits all of them with his blade, which causes them to stop in place. This comes at the surprise of the minion and hearthstabber. As Fung continues to cut his way through the bullets, the minion screams at his boss. That guy is already at the 25-yard mark. He will soon finish. Heartstabber tells him to shut up, as he is getting on his nerves. This game just came out, however, in front of him is a player that can predict the bullet trajectories. He's even blocking them with his blade. His control over the player character is amazing. Suddenly, he tells him to watch out, as he knows what's up next. The Gatling guns. The goblins unleash a flurry of bullets like never before, which makes Heartstabber think that this challenge is impossible. However, Fung goes past his expectations and defends himself with all of his might. The final attack is a mighty explosion, and the spectators watch closely, and fortunately Fung makes it out, with him jumping to the finish line. The goblin holding the flag congratulates him, as his clear time was 14 seconds. Thus, he achieved the bronze ranking. While the group and goblins congratulate his achievement, the system awards him with one silver coin and a swordsman skill, Thundering Slash. This ability sends three forward slashes, and each slash deals 10% damage, with the other ones hitting for 20% each if they hit. Fung thinks that this is amazing, as the Swordsman class is one that focuses on dealing damage to a single target, but this skill is one of the few that are AoE, which will allow him to do a lot of things from now on. Suddenly, he notices the group looking at him greedily, so he tells them to continue trying as he is leaving, but they should not forget that they still have 50 copper to give him. The minions think that this is the perfect opportunity to take his prize and book it. But Heartstabber hits both of them, as they are supposed to be at his feet right now, not steal from him. Having achieved his objective of getting the talent book now, it is time for Fung to begin training in earnest. He arrives at the Red Leaf Forest, where players are making groups in order to hunt together, and thinks that he only has 30 copper left after buying 20 explosive berries, he really needs to kill some mobs and earn some money. He arrives at the mob spawning area and sees a well-balanced group with two warriors at the front, a long-range dealer and a healer to boot. However, their experience will be split between four members, but he can't lie, for early leveling, this is the safest way to hunt. The players group up like this because the death penalty in God's domain is quite large. Not only does one drop a level if they die, but they lose equipment too. One of the group members warns him to not come close, as this is their prey. But Fung was not planning to at all, as these are too low level for him to care about. He continues to wander around the red leaf forest and comes up on some bears, but he thinks that again, they are too low level. And additionally, the bears can use a skill to call another group of bears to come, so it's quite dangerous. Eventually, he finds a wolf drinking some water and thinks that this is the perfect target for him, as one wolf is easy to deal with and even with its agility, he is much faster. He continues to step back until he goes too far and the earth falls beneath him as he has reached the end of the hill. Fung manages to land beautifully somehow, but this blunder causes him to be at the front of a wolf den who seems extremely hungry for his flesh. They start chasing after him, and Fung laments deciding to hunt that damn wolf. The wolves try to take a bite of him. However, he moves through them, and without much choice, he uses the gravity ring to increase his speed. Thus, he manages to get away. Due to his panic, he didn't see where he was running to, but it seems he has arrived at the central mountain range, which might be a good thing for him, as he heard that a silver chest is hidden at the peak of this mountain, which he will gladly take. Eventually, Fung arrives at the target location and notes that normally, one couldn't get up here and would need to use a skill like the hidden skill, flying steps, in order to get up there which unlocks after players put 40 points in agility. However, for him it is quite easy, as he has his ring, which allows him to climb the mountain without much effort. When he arrives at the top of the mountain, a giant green hand emerges from the ground, but he has expected this. This beast is called the Rock Giant, and it's level 5. Fung prepared the berries specifically for this mob, as they impair the movement speed of the target by 30%, and turning speed is also reduced by 70%. Fung uses one of them after dodging an attack, which slows the already slow giant tremendously, allowing Fung to go behind him and strike twice. This is Fung's strategy, to use the berries on the giant and hit it freely, 
which will give him tons of proficiency XP. The giant tries to retaliate, but it is far too slow for such an agile swordsman, so it misses entirely. Fung continues to strike the giant again and again, until he is done with it, and slays it. Fortunately, the giant also drops a piece of gear, the gorgeous cloth shirt, which has pretty nice stats for now. Fung notices a few bats coming out of a cave, so he decides to go exploring in it, which makes him eventually find Shrews, a level 6 elite mob. This might seem intimidating, but Fung still attacks, as a level 6 elite is still pretty doable. He decides to attack it before it wakes up, which only takes a sliver of his HP. Shrews wakes up angry and can speak, calling Fung a puny mortal who does not know his place. Fung manages to dodge upwards and prepares a berry, as even if this lump has tons of HP, it has no agility, and if he uses a berry, he will have an easy time. Just like with the giant, he manages to activate one before Shrews can do anything, and this allows him to unleash a flurry of attacks, which deal little damage, but they do damage nonetheless. However, the Elite heals back all the damage he took. As the Elites do this, they heal 2% of their total health every 5 seconds. Fung thinks that his attacks cannot keep up with this guy's mighty regeneration, so he must use Thundering Flash as efficiently as possible in order to deal some damage. His idea seems to be working, as the Elite receives more damage than he can heal, but suddenly, it sends Fung flying back using a barrier and smashes the ground beneath them in pieces, which makes Fung think that this is its party wipe technique. He is a solo player, however, and manages to dodge the large attack pretty easily, but that's when he notices that the Elite has entered a fatigued state, which is what bosses go through once they unleash their ultimate attacks. During this period, their defense, regeneration and attack drop drastically. Fung thinks that it's now or never, so he charges in swiftly and stabs the giant's eye with his sword. Shrews tries to defend himself, but Fung moves ever so swiftly and drops down, allowing him to cut up the giant's leg with ease. Unfortunately, the fatigue state ends, and the gigantic elite moves behind Fung using a teleportation technique, which allows it to hit Fung with all of its might. This sends Fung flying, but he survives in just 2 HP. Instead of lamenting, he smiles, as this is the final chance he has at defeating this thing. He charges in using Thundering Slash and follows it up with a mighty slash. Finally, he throws the sword in Shrew's core, which destroys him utterly. The Elite starts dropping his loot, and among it is a skill, Parry, which does what it says. Fung decides to learn it now, as it might save his skin one day, and leaves out of the cave fully equipped, thinking that now is the perfect time to really scale the mountain. When he arrives at the top of the mountain, he spots a small town, but also very dense fog, that shouldn't be here in the first place. Suddenly, the system announces that he has discovered the Lost Lands and activates a hidden quest, Past Glory. Fung tries to remember something about this, but he only remembers that there was a mithril chest around here, nothing about a hidden quest. The quest prompt doesn't give him a clear objective, and so he remembers that this is a special mission that will only be triggered in a specific area, and it will be sealed permanently once it's done. Fung remembers because some forum users kept bragging about it constantly, but he never expected that he would bump into one. However, since he's already here, he might as well give it a try. Push comes to shove, he will just die and return to the city. He enters a few homes and begins exploring, but he finds nothing of value to the quest, which angers him, as this is taking way too much of his time. He thinks that it's better to look from above, and so he climbs a house, just in time for the smoke to clear, allowing him to spot the mage's tower, his next destination. When he arrives, Fung thinks that surely, this is where the quest wants him to go. And sure enough, after he enters, an elderly mage welcomes him to the city of the sky. Fung is shocked when he hears this name, as it is renowned in God's domain, but this place should have disappeared long ago. Why would it be here? The mage notes that he must have come here to become stronger, and if that's the case, he can help him. Does he accept the test? Fung accepts. And the mage tries to tell him about the difficulties. But Fung chooses the hardest one instantly, as he has already been reborn once. He cannot afford to lose any chance he receives. The mage admires his courage, and wishes him good luck on the quest. With that, the quest updates. He must face up against 1,000 monsters of the same level, and kill a minimum of 500 to pass. The limit is four hours. Outside of the mage tower, countless undead warriors appear and rush to attack Fung, 
it seems that this will not be an easy quest. Fung looks at the incoming horde and thinks that the best way to do this is not charge in like a madman, but lead these guys in a narrow space where he can face them one by one. He enters the tower and jumps down on the stairs, providing him the best stage to clear these guys out with ease. Just like he expected, the monsters can only come two at a time at most, so he begins slashing and slashing. Fung thinks that if he continues doing it this way, this quest will be a piece of cake. At the 400 slay mark though, a bunch of Spectre assassins appear, which ignore the staircase completely and jump towards him using the nearby walls, providing them ample opportunity for a surprise attack. Fung notices them, however, and kicks the two that were attacking him away just in time, while also knocking a basic soldier down too. He turns his attention to the remaining soldier and thrusts his sword in his head, but that's when a sneaky assassin lunges at his back and manages to hit him, taking a quarter of his HP. Fung kicks this assassin away too, but finds it extremely annoying that they keep attacking from behind, and when he looks down, he notices that there are even more. This is not good, as these monsters have a lot of agility, even for him. But fortunately, he has 80 monsters left to kill, and they are very weak in terms of HP, so he will manage. The assassins jump him yet again, but this time Fung is prepared, and slashes them before they can even land. Seeing that the job is not done, he jumps in himself and continues to cut them up until he is sure that there is nothing left of them. When he is done, he falls down with the assassins, but he is very tired. The elder mage appears and congratulates him for his fortitude, granting him a chest and a title, a thousand to one, which gives his allies a 10% stat boost, while he receives five strength and endurance. With that, the mage just ups and disappears as his job is done, much to Fung's dismay, who wanted to ask more questions about a lot of things. Because the quest was done, Fung is just teleported back to the town and takes a mighty fall because the teleporter was positioned in the sky for some odd reason. Fung did not want this, as now there's a risk of other players snatching his hard-earned golden chest. So he goes to a nearby alley and opens it, with the contents being quite a surprise for him. What he gained from the chest is the Abyssal Blade, a magical weapon. A magic weapon is something that can improve the user's strength by quite a lot, but it also comes with a great risk, as if the user is not careful, they might cripple their player character forever. Since Fung prefers the stability he has now, he chooses to store the weapon, but he also got two other items from the chest, the records of potions, and the book of foraging. With them, training these two skills will become extremely easy. Now, Fung chooses to go to the Dark Moon Valley, as he knows about a quest there that will allow the user to learn foraging for free. And with the book, Leveling it up will become very convenient. Since he has a lot of equipment he does not use anymore, he chooses to sell it, as he is sure to attract some customers with these bronze tier items. He starts offering his wares to everyone, and some guys are amazed, as this is not easy equipment to get, since most of them are still running around with their beginner equipment. Naturally, there are some haters too, that note that there was a guy who killed the mayor when the server just launched. Unbeknownst to them, he is the one and only. But that doesn't matter, as others come around and say that thanks to that bastard, they can't take the quest. Through all of that noise, Hay calls him, and is very glad that he picked up, as he tried to contact him previously. But he didn't have any signal. Anyways, he is one level below everyone else, so they need to do something now. Fung apologizes, as he has been just grinding quests, but he should come to the central square, as they can level him up later. Suddenly. Flaming Tiger, the leader of the Shadow in Redleaf Town, tells everyone to get out of the way, because as of now, they possess everything this stall has, so the sale has ended. He asks Fung if he's the owner, which he confirms, but he also remembers this guy, as in his previous life, this Flaming Tiger character used him as a chess piece time and time again before throwing him away, but now, he will pay him for that awful treatment. Suddenly, Flaming Tiger puts his axe at Fung's neck and notes that they will take everything in the stand for a single silver coin. Sounds like a good deal, right? Fung tells him that he does not allow bargaining at this stall, so if he wants to roleplay as a young master of a noble house, he can do it somewhere else. Naturally, this infuriates Flaming Tiger, and his men circle around him, ready to attack at any second. Fung thinks that he's still the same, stupid and heartless. Additionally, it seems that he does not know that they cannot fight while in town, so all of this show is literally for nothing. Just as Flaming Tiger is about to strike Fung fruitlessly, Heartstabber arrives 
and tells Flaming Tiger that he shouldn't leave the Assassin's Alliance out of such a deal. Isn't that right? He greets Fung warmly and explains that he will give 24 silver for everything he has. Isn't that a better deal? Fung likes his straightforward attitude, so he accepts the deal, tells him to stop worrying about that 50 copper, and also adds him as a friend. Suddenly, Hei arrives, and so Fung leaves, much to Heartstabber's dismay, who really wanted to talk with him more. Hei asks what they're going to do now, and Fung notes that they will just farm monsters at the Dark Moon Valley, which surprises Hei, as that place is home to level 4 monsters which are extremely dangerous. Fung tells him not to worry, as he has a plan, and one of Flaming Tiger's subordinates asks if he's really going to let him go like that. He tells this subordinate, Quiet Wolf, to keep a really close eye on that kid, as he will not allow this kind of disrespect, and will definitely make him regret not selling to them. While they walk to the Dark Moon Valley, Hei asks if they are really going there, as that territory is filled to the brim with level 4 monsters, and most players dare not hunt monsters who are even one level higher than them. So how are they going to defeat the beasts, when they are level 2 and level 0 respectively? Fung tells him to not worry, as like he said, he knows an expert from the beta test, so he knows a few tips and tricks to keep them alive for longer. Hei asks if he really is a trustworthy source, but Fung asks him, since the public server launched, how many level 2 players does he think are in the entire server? The majority of the elites in the workshops are still level 1, and he only managed to get to level 2 with the information provided by the generous beta tester. Hey, after hearing this, gains newfound confidence, but unfortunately, Quiet Wolf is after them, who is also quite puzzled as to why they are going to a level 4 zone, but it does not matter, as he is sure this will be a deadly trip. After a while, Hei spots a cunning snow fox, a level 2 monster, and Fung thinks that this is lucky, as blue name monsters are elites, so they are very valuable. While he charges in, he tells Hei to damage the beast from range, and leave the tanking to him. Fung moves slowly, and surprises the beast with a swift attack, but he only dealt 32 damage, which Fung did not expect at all. The fox, after regaining its footing, jumps back at Fung who manages to block its attack with his sword, but after he lets go, he is dealt 49 damage. Hei does not know what to do, but Fung screams at him to get his act together and attack the thing with all that he's got. Hei does just that, but he only deals 5 to the fox, which he is scared of, as he has dumped every stat point into intelligence. Fung encourages him to not be scared, as he will keep the aggro on him. All he needs to do is continue attacking the thing. Hei does just that, but the beast manages to land another blow on Fung, who is now very low HP. This comes at the gladness of Quiet Wolf, who thinks that he won't have to do anything. The fox jumps into attack once again, and keeps biting Fung's sword again and again, which starts deteriorating fast, and it will soon be destroyed. In a last-ditch effort, Fung hits the fox in the gut and throws it away. He did not want to do this, but it seems that he will have to start using his abilities from now on. He dodges the fox's next attack, and drinks a iron beer, which decreases the level of the enemy in front of him by two, which will certainly give him the opportunity to end this. With this advantage, he starts striking the fox again and again, much to Hei's surprise, but Fung feels that it's not enough, and prepares a large strike to finish the fight. But suddenly, an invisible force rushes to him, and Fung barely manages to dodge the incoming blade. Quiet Wolf appears, and notes that he's pretty observative, to dodge an invisible attack like that. Fung is surprised, but not shocked, as he knew that Flaming Tiger only kept around awful company, such as this coward. Suddenly, the monster uses gigantification, and its attack, speed, and health are all increased by 20%. This puts Fung in an awful situation, and Hei screams at him to watch out, as the assassin dude is trying to pin him down with the help of the fox. Seeing this, Fung uses his brain and kicks the fox that is charging at him directly in Quiet Wolf's direction which surprises the both of them and takes out the assassins, as he cannot hope to dodge such a fast attack. With that, the only opponent they have remaining is the fox, which they attack in unison, allowing them to eventually take it down, which awards them with 10 EXP each. The drop from the fox is a common Blackwood staff that is of bronze tier and would be really useful on a mage. Fung thinks the same too, and gives it to Hei, as it will be better on him, since he is intelligence-based. Hei doesn't feel that this is fair, since without him, he wouldn't have dreamed of ever taking down the fox. But Fung tells him to stop being polite like they are strangers, 
He is a curse mancer, and this staff is for people like him, not a swordsman who doesn't even know how to use it. With that explanation, Hay graciously accepts his new gift and is quite glad to have a new item. Back in the town, Flaming Tiger kicks Quiet Wolf around because he couldn't even manage to deal with a level 2 swordsman. Quiet Wolf thinks that Flaming Tiger is a vicious and merciless man, so he will most definitely kick him out of the party if he tells him that he was killed while attempting to ambush the target. To save his skin, Quiet Wolf fabricates a story that he found a rare elite in the wilds, but it was discovered by Fung too, just as he was about to finish it off. Additionally, he also had someone new with him, and they were both heading for Dark Moon Valley. If he goes there too, he is positive that he will be able to retrieve the drop from the Elite Monster. After hearing Elite Monster, Flaming Tiger's ears perked up, and he tells everyone in his group that now they will go to the Dark Moon Valley too. How dare a mere beginner steal what belongs to him? He is going to make sure that he never touches this game again. Hei and Fung wait around in a forge, and Hei wonders just how long they're going to be waiting around, as it has been half an hour already. But Fung tells him to be patient, as this is the only way to trigger the quest he wants. Ten minutes later, the blacksmith notices them and asks if they are interested in forging, which Fung says that he is. It has been his dream ever since he was young. With that, he gets the hidden quest, Road to Forging, where he must give Master Jack 100 pieces of meteorite ore from the Crimson Star Mine. Hei and Fung arrive at the mine where the recommended level is 4, and it is filled to the brim with burly kobolds. Fung pulls out a smoke bomb that reduces the visibility in a 10-yard radius for one entire hour. He throws it in the middle of the kobolds and tells Hei to start shooting beams. Seeing that he is still level 0 and he has nothing to lose, he does just that and hits one of the kobolds quite well. But it doesn't die, and it turns his way. Hei thinks that this is the end, but Fung explains that the smoke bomb will cover him, and since the kobolds have poor vision already, they won't be able to see him if he remains at 30 yards distance from them. He will be safe. Hei continues attacking and manages to take one of them down, which makes him think that this is very easy XP, so he continues shooting beams until all of the kobolds in the area are down. He recharges his mana with a potion and tells Fung to look at the amount of loot that they dropped, some meteorite ore, but also a level 3 cloth armor piece. Fung remembers that the drop rate of a single piece of meteorite is 1 per 100 kobolds, but Hei only killed a couple dozen and already has several pieces of ore. The luck they have is truly amazing. After their conversation is over, Fung jumps in and right in front of the kobolds, who start chasing him, giving him ample time to put a smoke bomb down and for Hei to unleash hell on them. After a lot of farming, Hei becomes level 2 and Feng level 3. Additionally, they also have new pieces of gear on them. While they loot around and Hei finds a new piece of gear for Feng, a dark figure pops up behind Hei, and Feng tries to warn him. He could not move fast enough, however, and he gets slashes three times by three different people, which leaves him on a quarter of his HP. Hei recognizes them as Flaming Tiger's subordinates, but even so, he will not fall down without a fight. But Quiet Wolf thinks that he's just a useless curse mancer, so he charges in once again, as he wants to kill Fung afterwards. Unfortunately for him, the dark arrow that Hei unleashes on him deals a whopping 185 damage, which even surprises him. Even after this deadly blow, Quiet Wolf doesn't give up, and orders the other two assassins to charge in all at once, as this mage cannot hope to defend himself now. True enough, Hei cannot unleash his magic so swiftly, but they seem to have forgotten about Fung, who cuts them down in a split second. A Hei looks at Fung with admiration, and is shocked to find out that he is so strong. Flaming Tiger and his subordinates arrive, and they all charge in, as even if their dumb assassins lost, they must show these lowlifes what it means to mess with the great Flaming Tiger. Before they can even get to them, Fung throws a smoke bomb at their feet, and chooses to retreat, much to the attacker's dismay. Flaming Tiger isn't too mad about this, however, as he notices that this place is a great place for leveling up, which puzzles his subordinates, as this is a level 4 zone, and most of them are way too low to even consider farming here. Flaming Tiger explains that they will use someone as bait and gather the kobolds in the smoke, which will make them stand still like puppets. They do just that and use basically the same technique that Fung used. The subordinates congratulate their leader for such a grand idea as this is really easy to level up. Flaming Tiger thinks that this is truly an amazing idea, 
and even though the XP is split among them, for each kill, they get 2% increase in experience. They can hunt here forever, and when the time comes, he will become the king of this world, ruling over others like he was destined to. After they run far away, Hei asks Feng if it's really alright to let them farm in their spot. But Feng tells him to not worry, let them enjoy themselves as much as they can, because soon they will find out that after great joy comes great sorrow. Suddenly, the smoke screen that was protecting them from the kobolds starts to disappear, and the hunters have just become the hunted, as the kobolds' eyes glisten at the sight of fresh meat. All of kobolds are now fully aware of their surroundings, and one immediately charges in, killing one of the subordinates with a single slash of its axe. The others follow suit and charge in as well, as this is very easy prey that doesn't seem to fight back. Flaming Tiger orders everyone to retreat, and laments that they worked so hard to get their members to level 2, but now after dying, they will drop back down to 1, and also drop a piece of gear. What bad luck! Seeing that he cannot save the others, Flaming Tiger runs away with his tail under his legs, and barely manages to get out alive by using all of his stamina. Unfortunately for him, Feng was waiting for him patiently, and he asked what happened. Did his subordinates get wiped out by the kobolds, perhaps? Flaming Tiger naturally thinks that it's his fault, and charges in with his diminished stamina. But Feng dodges, and slashes him from behind. Feng starts mocking him, which makes Flaming Tiger throw his axe around, and he swears that he will kill him, over and over again, until he gets to level zero. This constant slashing doesn't prove fruitful for him, and tires him out, which makes him call Feng a coward who can only evade. Feng tells him that he will stand still now, and to come already, but before Flaming Tiger can fully get to him, Feng uses his Thundering Flash, which depletes Flaming Tiger's HP bar fully. Feng stands above him, and notes that he didn't say anything about countering, but also thanks him, as he has saved him a lot of time by farming that much ore for him, he didn't know he was so nice. With his last moments, Flaming Tiger promises to have his revenge soon, and gets respawned in the town with the others. He sees their dumb looks, and tells them to check their inventories, and see what has been lost and what hasn't. Naturally, he does the same, and finds out that the skill book he was saving is gone, so he screams at everyone to listen up, as they must go back to the Dark Moon Valley and kill the brat who did this to them without prejudice. Suddenly, he receives a call from one Jang, who seems to be Flaming Tiger's leader. He asks what he's doing, and Flaming Tiger explains that he's only reprimanding his useless subordinates. Those words of anger were not aimed towards him, he promises. Jang tells him to stop feigning ignorance as he knows what happened. Look at him. He graciously gave him Redleaf Town to take over. But he does this? From now on, he is no longer squad leader. And if he doesn't get to level 2 by the time he gets out of Redleaf Town, he will be kicked out of their organization, Shadow. After the call ends, Flaming Tiger screams out Feng's name, as it seems that he has become his arch nemesis. At Dark Moon Valley, Hei and Feng loot what Flaming Tiger dropped, and Hei is very happy to see him drop so much stuff. However, he would like to see his expression when he respawns. Feng also finds the skill book that he had, which holds a skill called Windblade that launches a group of sneak attack at the enemy, and upon usage, speed and damage also increase. He thinks that this skill is designed to harass long-range attackers, which is extremely good for close-range swordsmen like him. Hei also wants a skill book too, but Feng tells him to wait for Flaming Tiger's next visit, as he will surely bring them another gift. While looting the remaining ore, Hei finds a strange dark green rock, and Feng explains that it's a star crystal that only has a drop rate of 1%. This makes Hei think that it's very expensive, but Feng tells him that it's not worth a single penny. However, in the future, it will be enough to buy entire cities with, so he should just put it in his inventory and forget about it, as he will understand when the time comes. Hei agrees and they go to dumb the ore they needed for the quest, which seems to be enough. Master Jack is happy with the amount, but notes that this was only the first step. Now he needs to prove his strength. Another quest pops up to defeat the elite kobold chieftain, but Fung is puzzled, as he did not hear anything about a second stage in his past life. But the real problem is that chieftain is a level 5 elite, which makes him on part with a dungeon boss. Even if they're more powerful now, players can only deal with that guy if they group up. Hei asks what's wrong, and Feng notes that he just got a different quest, but Hei tells that with him leading the team, every quest will be very easy from now on. Feng says that he was a coward hours ago, 
but now he's brimming with confidence? Well, if he listens to his commands well, he doesn't really care either way. When they arrive at the Crimson Star Cavern, they both get ready, and Fung is the first to attack as many enemies as he can, with Hei following suit, unleashing tons of beams in the kobolds. They both engage in a bloody battle, and eventually come out on top, which makes Hei say that this mission doesn't seem that difficult, but Feng tells him to keep vigilant, as they haven't gotten to the main target just yet. Suddenly the cavern begins to shake violently, and sure enough, the true target appears, the kobold chieftain, who has a myriad of powerful skills. Hei is shocked to see so many, and Feng tells him that they need to finish this soon, since the quest has a time limit. Hei asks if they can really defeat such a beast, as even if they ignore its gigantic health pool, it has extremely high defense, and he is sure that if they take a blow from that huge axe, it's over. Fung doesn't rightly know, but the consequences of failing this mission are harsh, so they only have one chance. If they fail, they will not be able to try again. Without much choice, Fung pulls out the sword that he did not wish to use anytime soon. One day, surrounded by thousands of enemy guild members, the Crimson War God took out his blood magic weapon, his mighty Crimson Ghost Axe, and mowed every single man there down. Eventually, he became famous through that battle and founded the War God Empire. However, not just anyone can use that power fully, and some even get consumed by their weapons due to the amount of backlash they have. The system asks if he would like this item bound to him, and with high confidence, Fung notes that even newbies can control magic weapons. He will not let himself be consumed by these things especially since he is reincarnated. With that, he bind the item to him, and the dragon's roar unleashes on him, which drains his levels fully, and he is now back to zero. He asks if he's okay, as his levels just dropped, but Feng calms him down, as now, he is stronger than ever before. This abyssal blade has tons of amazing stats, is growable, but also evolvable, a perfect weapon for someone like Feng, whose potential knows no bounds. Tired of waiting around, the boss spawns a few kobolds that immediately charge the party without a thought. Fung notes that he will be enough to deal with them, which Hei agrees with instantly. Fung gets ready to attack, and when he does, all of the kobolds fall to his blade in an instant, showing just how powerful he has become. With the weaklings gone, Fung begins fighting the chieftain, who misses once, but actually manages to hit him once, which cuts Fung in half. Hei is shocked by this. But fortunately, this was just one of Fung's new skills that creates a clone with half of his stats. The real Fang is right next to the chieftain's face, and before he notices him fully, Fung unleashes a mighty attack and uses that momentum to keep attacking. After he is done with those, he backs away slightly and hits the chieftain with a much better slash ability that sends the chieftain's HP bar to half. Seeing that its HP is diminished, the chieftain becomes enraged, with its power increasing by 100%. Fung isn't scared, however, as even if he has more power, his attacks are slow, so he will be able to dodge. The chieftain tries to crush him under his hand, and suddenly, while Fung is still dodging, it increases its attack speed by 100%, making Fung dodge and dodge without any chance of attack. Suddenly, Hei attacks him, which grabs his attention instantly, and Fung tells him to run, while he still can. Hei isn't too fast, however, and can only accept his fate as the axe of the chieftain falls on him. Out of nowhere, tons of chains appear and bind the chieftain. This is Fung's skill, Abyssal Bind. Even if Fung tries his best, eventually, the chieftain breaks free, just in time for Fung to jump at his face level and strike him very hard. Seeing this as his only opportunity to get out of there, Hei books it and leaves Fung to fight the chieftain, whose attacks have become even more deadly, as they cover the entire cavern at this point. Afterwards, the chieftain opens his mouth and a couple of hounds come out. Fung knows that the boss is just trying to buy time with this, but he cannot drag this any longer so he will have to use that skill. But he doesn't know how long he will be able to control nine abyssal blades with his current psychic power. Fung activates the nine dragon slash, and just when the hounds are about to jump on him, the swords come to his rescue and slash all around. Using the swords, Fung deals a couple of deadly blows to the chieftain, but he doesn't stop there as he charges forwards too and aims to end the battle. Unfortunately, the skill catches up to him, and he falls down, as his psychic power is too low. This leaves him at the chieftain's mercy, and Hei tells him that it's okay to give up. He has far surpassed himself already. Why risk everything right now? Feng remembers all that has happened to him. Give up? 
In his previous life, he worked extremely hard without complaints and helped build an empire, but was thrown away like trash. He does not know if what happened to him was a blessing from heaven or a fate decision, but he will not give up now. He will rewrite his destiny, no matter what. With newfound confidence and better mental strength, he charges in, and before the chieftain can do anything, Fung and his clones strike its eyes and continue slashing it all over. The chieftain tries to retaliate, which gives Fung the opportunity to back away and use the clone to launch himself through the chieftain, ending the fight once and for all. After Fung takes a moment to rest, Hei walks up to him and notes that what he did is nothing short of incredible. Fung tells him that he's extremely lucky once again, as the boss has dropped a rare skill book for curse mancers, but Hei thinks that, even with this luck, he still won't be able to help after all. Seeing that Fung is an expert in these types of things, he asks him to teach him about the curse mancer class and how to play it, as he wants to get stronger and help when the time comes. Fung agrees and asks what his point allocation is in. Hei explains that he put everything in intelligence, as most people do that. Fung hits him in his forehead and notes that is not the way to go, even if the curse mancer is damage class. Only five minutes ago, a gigantic axe wanted to end his life, but he didn't move an inch. Did he perhaps forget? Hei agrees that he almost died there without doing anything, and Fung notes that if he hadn't graciously saved him, he would have been sent back to town. Anyways, there's no point to him dealing tons of damage if he's dead, so he should invest a portion of his points into agility, as it not only helps at movement speed, but it also increases his casting speed. When they finish that conversation, Fung announces that the chieftain dropped tons of items, so there's a robe he can get too, besides this rare skill book. It holds the skill Evil Whip, that binds the target in a fixed area, and deals damage to them if they try to escape. Hei is very glad to own this, and asks if it's not the same as his Abyssal Bind. Fung explains that even if they work the same, they have different casting times, with his skill taking three seconds to cast, so he must predict his enemy and their movements from now on. With that, they both get equipped, Fung with the leather armor and black iron, and Hei with the violet blood leggings and violet blood robe. A nice set. Eventually, they make it back to the forge, and Master Jack congratulates Fung for completing his task. Truly, he is worthy of inheriting his forging techniques. The system rewards him with basic forging, the forging genius talent, and additionally, 10 refinement steel. Hei asks what forging genius does, as it sounds very powerful. But Fing notes that when one successfully forges something, they have a chance to gain two proficiency points. Hei finds it disappointing. However, Fung tells him to not underestimate two points, as one would need a thousand of them to advance from an apprentice to an intermediate. Additionally, forging common items only gives one proficiency point. This talent, Forging Genius, can reduce the time and money one spends on advancing their forging skill by a ton, so it's very useful even if he doesn't see it now. Hei kind of gets it, as it sounds incredible when he explains it, so he asks Fung to forge him some equipment sometime, since he will probably have to do it anyway. Fung explains that even though he has acquired the skill, he still needs blueprints in order to create anything. This makes him think about the Deathly Forest, as that place will drop bronze tier equipment blueprints. Beginners need tons of equipment, and he will be able to deal with two things at a time by leveling his forging and making money. With that, they get ready to leave. But just as they are about to get out, the master notices the sword he has, and notes that if that blade really is a magic weapon, it is imbued with a vile and evil curse. Additionally, now that he looks better at him, the curse has already started to seep into his body, and he will soon receive backlash from it. However, this is his first time seeing such a weapon in all of his years as a smith, so may he see it just for a little bit. Fung thinks that this must be some type of hidden quest, and so he gives it to him. Master Jack carefully wields the blade, and explains that this is a famous sword, forged by the very renowned craftsman Ulysses, from the Fang of the Black Dragon King. It ranks 31st among the 36 famous swords in God's domain, and the Black Dragon King's Fang has given this sword with incredible power. However, it also has an evil curse in it. Sometimes this sword causes a heavy backlash on the user, and if they are unable to suppress it, they will fall pretty to the Black Dragon King's curse and get all of their attributes halved permanently. Unfortunately for him, it seems that the backlash effect has already started. Fung asks if there's any way to get rid of this curse, but Jack says that there is no real way to break the curse. He can only offer a method to weaken it, but this will require something of equally great power. 
He must go and find the lucky stones, the only things that can help him resist the curse. However, these types of stone are exceedingly rare, and just randomly getting one is up to fate in this situation. Fung then tells Hei to give him the stone he has, which apparently is the lucky stone, leaving Jack truly awestruck, noting that he really is extraordinary. Fung thinks that in his past life, after God's domain went live, these extremely rare, yet utterly useless stones were collectively renamed Lucky Stones, and the demand for them increased by a large margin. He notes that they will have to bother him once again, but Jack doesn't see it as a bother, as he is truly honored to work on such a strong magical weapon with his own hands. He puts the Lucky Stone on the forge, and gets to work forging it into the sword, with extreme carefulness. Eventually the blade is done, and now there is only a 10% chance of the curse activating, much better than the previous chance rate, judging by Jack's attitude. Fung thanks him for his hard work, and leaves, but not before Jack can bow down to him, as this was truly an experience worth remembering. When they're walking away, Fung receives a message from Lonely Snow, the warrior guy he met in the town hall, and he also told him about the monster hunting spot. He tells Fung that his three friends and him have reached level two. Does he want to join them in the Deathly Forest, perhaps? Fung explains that with his curse mancer friend, they make a party of six, and he also knows a beta tester, so he knows tons of things about the Deathly Forest. Lonely Snow agrees to have him be the leader, and also agrees to his condition, that all swordsman and curse mancer equipment be given to them, no matter what. Fung tells Hei that they have been invited to a dungeon, so they should go. But Hei wonders why take other people in the first place. Couldn't they just do it by themselves? Fung explains that the Deathly Forest is a party dungeon. They need a minimum number of participants to get in. Plus, this will increase their chances of success, so it's fine. Eventually, they arrive at the dungeon meeting place, where tons of players are already gathered, looking for a good party. Lonely Snow manages to find them through the crowd, and thanks Feng for the hunting place he recommended, as he has easily grinded to level 2. His friends had to grind a lot to get to level 2, so with him in charge, they will clear this extremely easily. They arrive at his friend's meeting location, and just when the wall they are about to form a party, they notice that he's only level 1, and they naturally get mad, as he expected them, the actual carries, to give him the swordsman and curse mancer equipment. Does he think that they are dumb? The tank gets up and close while picking his nose, and asks him, why is he still level 1 despite the server being open for a long time? Is he that weak? The mage also gets in his case, as he cannot believe that someone so arrogant wanted to order them on how they should raid the dungeon. Does he have no shame? Seeing how the situation changed, both Hei and Fung leave the party. As it's not wise to spend more time on these guys, they will not see to reason if he explains it. Lonely still doesn't like this, and dumps his friends in order to go with Fung. His friends warn him that the guy is most definitely a scammer, and that he will come to regret it, but he ignores them. He comes close to Fung and notes that he wants to join the party, which Fung accepts, and Hei notes that he has amazing judgment and he promises that he will not be disappointed with his choice. Fung tells Hei to take his staff out and cast every special option he has. He does just that and announces that they have an expert here who is waiting for more players. Lonely's friends still think that he's a scammer and that he has no shame. What arrogance to claim that he's an expert and he's just level one. One of them still decides to look and spots that the curse mancer is equipped to the brim with very good loot. The mage of the party tells them that the curse mancer was level three all of this time, which he apparently did not want to tell earlier. However, even if the curse mancer was good, his friend would have still been a burden. So they get the idea to bribe him to their side as surely he will accept if they let him pick up all of the mage equipment. They try just that, but Hei brushes them off instantly. He even flips them off, showing that they have lost their chance a long time ago. More and more people gather to form the party with Fung, but the moment they see that he's level one, they brush him off, which makes Lonely think that it won't be easy to take in new members. Suddenly, everyone rushes away, and their eyes are filled with hearts as White Snow accompanied by her teammates, Zhao and Xiao, arrive. The men around her fall to their knees at her sight, but Feng recognizes her and wonders what she's doing here. Hei is also mesmerized by her beauty, until Feng wakes him up with a single powerful punch. The other men try to form a party with them, but Zhao notices that most of them are not even good players, just beginners. Naturally, 
Lonely's friends also try to make them team up, but their seduction skills really need improving, as nobody would accept their incessant asking. Zhao chooses to shut them up by intimidating them, but this only makes them admire her even more. Eventually, she makes all of them steer away. But Feng expected this, as in his previous life, Zhao was known as the Flame Witch, and he recalls a moment where she was harassed by the Guildmaster of the Central Plains Guild, and as a result, the 10,000-member guild was destroyed overnight. The Guildmaster was constantly slain by Zhao, and Hiwa dropped back to level zero, making him never set foot in God's domain ever again. Feng and White Snow make eye contact, and she feels that, that he's different somehow. Zhao thinks that he's just trying to be mysterious, like some other men do, but White Snow ignores her and goes up to him, so they have no choice but to follow. Zhou asks how he dares even attempt going in the Deathly Forest with only one level to his name, but Feng defends himself as if he is searching for members. It goes to show that he has a way to clear the dungeon. Would they like to join their party? Zhou instantly gets on his case, but White Snow tells her to calm down, as even if he is level one, the Curse Mancer next to him is equipped with three bronze rank items, so he definitely has some talent. Additionally, that weapon he has is quite mysterious, but Zhou thinks that it's just a piece of junk, so she asks him, what kind of strategy does he have for the dungeon, as Deathly Forest has never been cleared by anyone before. Feng notes that he got his info from the closed beta test, which puzzles White Snow, as she hasn't heard of any leaks, and Zhou calls him out, as he must be lying. Feng notes that it's up to them, but he will give everyone here a piece of advice. The Deathly Forest doesn't have that many tough enemies, so the real killer is getting lost in it, as it is filled with traps. And if one was to get super lost, they would have to eliminate themselves in order to respawn. They all think it's bull, but Fung tells them to ask the respawn players and see if it's real or not. Seeing that he is quite informative and has a cool head, White Snow accepts his party invitation, which causes the mage girl to blush for some reason. Joe still doesn't trust him, but there's nothing she can do now, and their party is formed, much to everyone's dismay. Hey thanks him for bringing such pretty and powerful women to their party. And so, they all get into the portal, where they are presented with three difficulty options. When they finally enter, the system announces that the Hell difficulty was chosen, much to everyone else's surprise, except Feng, who naturally was the one who chose this option. He can't believe that he would choose something so dangerous, and Zhang thinks that he's trying to screw them over, but Feng calms them down, as he is confident that they will succeed. Lonely asks what path to take, and Feng tells him to follow, as they can get lost easily. Xiao notices that they are moving away, and White Snow says that they should trust them, this time at least. In his past life, the first people to conquer the Deathly Forest were the Shadow Guild, who sent hundreds of members to explore the area, and the result was a map that showed a total of 36 paths, but only three of those lead to the first boss. While walking, White Snow notices that he chose the path with the least enemies as they passed patrol after patrol of monsters, and they were able to evade them every time. Zhao asks why not fight them, and Feng explains that mobs do not drop anything good here, so there's no reason to consume resources. He notices a clearing in front of them, and thinks that this is the boss area. But when they go there, there's nothing, just an empty clearing. Suddenly, the earth begins to shake, and Feng tells everyone to get ready, as the boss is about to come out. He does just that, and jumps out of the ground in a powerful fashion, and lands down. This is Wilmy, a night rabbit with a dark attitude. It likes to welcome humans with a warm bloodbath. Naturally, this bath is drawn from their own blood, and he likes to eat their meat afterwards. Fung tells them to not be intimidated, as they are surely ready for this moment, and White Snow gets in front, ready to protect Xiao. Fung asks her to keep playing the role of tank, and tells Xiao to not pull too much aggro from the mob. The role of tank is played by those who have a class that has high defense and health. Their responsibility is to make the monsters focus on them, while the other players attack from behind. But the attackers should be careful too, as if they pull too much aggro, they will be the ones attacked by the boss. Fung promises to give the clearest instructions possible, but suddenly, Lonely charges in without a thought in his mind. While Lonely charges in, Feng tells him not to, as they would at least have to get buffs from Xiao first. Unfortunately, Lonely cannot stop his skill while it is in effect, but he still attempts it, leaving him to fly towards the bunny which is quite confused, but nonetheless this is the perfect opportunity to strike Lonely down. 
He thinks that this is the end for him. But Hay says otherwise as he unleashes his binding spell on the bunny, leaving him completely motionless. Lonely thanks him for the support, and without any room to raise his sword, he headbutts the rabbit which damages him more than it does the creature, but it was a valiant assault. Zhao wonders if this guy thinks he's a cannonball or something, and Xiao instantly gets to heal him, which he is very thankful for. Eventually, the rabbit manages to escape the now stiff constraints that were on him, but Lonely, now fully healed up, charges in once again and he begins to trade blows with the raging rabbit. White Snow and Feng also charge in to help him, with Feng thinking that for his experience, his movement is pretty good. They both manage to strike the rabbit, and Zhao also wants to contribute, so she tells Lonely to get out of the way and unleashes a mighty flame attack that hits the rabbit for 118 damage. She is glad to find that she is still the best damage dealer around, but unfortunately for her, this has angered the rabbit, and so it changes its aggro, while also buffing itself with 30% more attack and speed. Both Feng and White Snow notice that the boss has changed aggro, and Zhao is quite puzzled by this, until the rabbit tries to claw at her. She finally remembers what Feng said about the tank and aggro, but now she cannot do anything to defend herself quickly. Suddenly, Feng uses a thundering flash on the rabbit, which hits it perfectly and grabs its attention very well. He explains that the boss in its enraged state has too much damage, so if they cannot defend against it, they should let him aggro the rabbit, as he is the quickest out of all of them. Zhao doesn't have to be told twice and runs away, leaving the rabbit to attack Feng. It slashes him away with its claws, and after there is distance, the rabbit jumps high into the air and uses death claws an ability that forms a couple of deadly slash-like projectiles. Seeing that Fung has protected against the attacks, the rabbit drops down and begins spinning around in place, which is apparently another ability, killing Feast that allows the rabbit to steadily approach Fung. He defends himself against this spinning attack, but some damage still goes through due to the impact. White Snow decides to help him now, and kicks the rabbit away, who is now tired from all of the action. Xiao heals Fung up, and he tells them to attack now while it is weakened, as its defenses are lower than ever. He also warns Zhao specifically to not steal the aggro again with her damage, which on the surface seems like she understands, but her true feelings are that she wants to rip him in half. They all attack the boss at once and Hei pushes them further, as the rabbit has little HP left. Feng uses an ability to throw it into the air, and Zhao finds this as an opportunity to unleash a larger attack, which creates large explosions all around the boss, and some even hit him. This attack was enough to slay him, and he drops tons of loot, which Lonely and Hei notice, but their celebrations are cut short by Feng, who tells them to heal up first, then split the loot. They all do just that, and Feng explains that the final boss is renowned for catching players by surprise, but it's not that difficult to defeat it, as long as they are ready. Xiao asks what he means, and suddenly the boss starts spawning a werewolf that is the same rank as the rabbit. This time, however, the party is not surprised at all and ready which leaves the werewolf quite confused as this is not the reaction he expected. Furthermore, when he sees the party charges in, he tries to retreat. Unfortunately for him, this party is resolute in their decisions and defeats him in a very short time. After the wolf boss dissipates into air, he drops even more loot than the rabbit, and most of it is very high quality, something which is to be expected since they defeated the hell difficulty. As promised, White Snow lets them choose the gear first, Fung is glad to find a blueprint on his first dungeon try, and the others also find some sweet items inside of this large pile. Hei equips himself with some dark gauntlet, a new dark robe, and also learns the Hellflame skill. Loyal learns the Whirlwind Slash, and also finds a new sword, an Iron Greatsword. Joe looks at them and their looting, making her say that they probably got all of the good things in that loot drop, but Xiao notes that without them, they wouldn't have been able to clear this dungeon so it's only right to let them loot first. After Fung's party is done looting, White Snow is surprised to see some good items still left, and so she thanks Fung. Zhao wonders what it is and sees that they left a potion recipe, which is very rare right now, but why? Fung explains that they played a very important role in this raid too, so he couldn't just leave them with nothing? Zhao seems touched by this gesture, and at the entrance to Deathly Forest, the players that are gathered start chatting about who will clear the dungeon first, with some of them thinking that it will be the Heaven's Crown and others the Assassin's Alliance. Unfortunately for them, their speculations are wrong, as Fung and his party were the first ones to clear the dungeon, leaving everyone shocked at this outcome. They watch as the party removes themselves from the portal and notice that they are all wearing high-quality gear now, 
which naturally attracts a few eyes of envy from others. White Snow invites Fung and his party in their guild, Uroboros. But Fung is used to playing in a smaller group, so he really isn't interested in joining a guild at the current moment. White Snow respects his decision. However, in three days her guild will be raiding an uncleared 20-man dungeon, Dark Moon Graveyard, and she would like to know if he's interested. Fung knows that only players with level 5 or above can enter that dungeon. So is she that confident in being able to gather so many people with such a high level, only in two days? She notes that he shouldn't underestimate Ouroboros like this, and truthfully she's right. Ouroboros doesn't refer to a single guild in a specific game. It is actually the leading guild organization among the dozens of virtual game worlds on the market out now. Ever since the start of God's Domain, conglomerates all around have been brushing into this new world, hoping to get a share of the emerging virtual market. Like them, Ouroboros had also wanted a piece of God's Domain for a long time, and they would use financial means in the real world to invest the strongest forces in God's Domain. Truly, gathering a 20-man group in only two days must be quite easy for them. White Snow adds Fung as her friend, so she can invite him when the time comes, and he notes that he believes in Ouroboros' strength, but she should reserve him a spot to let him pick any swordsman equipment and blueprints. Joe thinks that he isn't humble at all, but Fung doesn't care. While Hei says that he is truly amazing, he managed to get a spot on White Snow's friend list. After she and her party leave, the other male players start staring Fung and his party down, which they notice quickly. Fung just tells them to bolt out of here, and they do just that, while the other players chase them around and ask them tons of questions about White Snow and the dungeon. Eventually, the party escapes the situation and arrives at the Dark Moon Valley portal, but finds that nobody is there, which Fung thinks is only natural as the other players are focused on leveling up and nobody would dare to challenge a level 4 dungeon without having a few backups. Suddenly, someone arrives and asks them to add him to their party. Fung finds his voice similar to someone, and when he looks closer, he realizes that this man is the Tyrant Bear, the one that will become the rank 15 Guardian Knight in the Star Moon Kingdom. This knight, by the name of Kola, was very depressed in the early days of this game, due to his inability to fulfill his role. Some idiots even kicked him out of a third-rate guild, but later, he would join the Radiant Stars Guild, change his name to Tyrant Bear, a much more fitting one, and become quite famous all around. This is a perfect opportunity, as if he gets in his good books right now, only good fortune will come in the future. Kola explains that he was clearing mobs while getting here, but he couldn't find anyone to group with, until he met them. Hay is quite suspicious of his words, and Kola notes that it's thanks to him just dragging the fights out as much as possible. They deduce that his defense must be insane, to be able to survive so many mobs' attacks without even a shred of worry. Lonely tells Fung that this is a good opportunity since this guy will be a much better tank than he is. Fung gives him an invite, and Lonely is very glad, as now he can quit his tank job and live his dream of being a DPS. Kola tells Fung that they are missing a healer. He has a healer friend, but he's an oracle, which makes Lonely say that oracles have the worst healing abilities by far, and if they summarize every class, the oracle must be the worst one. Fung tells him otherwise, as sure their healing isn't the strongest, but they have high HP and their signature skill called Life Payment allows them to turn the damage they take into healing, so one in their party would greatly decrease the stress that the tank would go through. Kola invites his friend Drowsy Sloth to the squad, and when he arrives, he thanks them for accepting him as he was kicked out of several parties previously, which made him consider deleting his account and making a new one since nobody wanted him. With that out of the way, they go inside where tons of goblins await them, but they did not expect Kola to just charge in on them and use a mighty taunt that grabs their attention fully. This gives Lonely the opportunity to use his new ability, which is quite amazing for AoE, and Hei also uses his, which takes down a lot of goblins with ease. Fung takes no time in dealing with these weak goblins, and they drop tons of ore pieces, which apparently are quite precious to players. Suddenly a giant robot falls out of the sky and this is a sudden event, where a boss spawns. In this case, it's a level 5 boss that ignores 95% of damage, basically a full team wipe. Hei asks Fung for instructions, but he has only one. Run! They begin doing just that and Fung explains that once they reach the entrance to the dungeon, they will get out of the gnome's patrol area so they should be relatively safe. Fung is so scared of this boss because in his past life he led a party in here too, and just like now, they met a hazard gnome boss. He was leading a team of elites 
and after butchering more than enough gnomes, the Hazard Gnome appeared. They were excited to see a new elite and wanted to defeat it, but their dreams ended in a second, as with just one attack, the Hazard Gnome took care of them. He begins shooting after the party, which makes Hay try to retaliate, but his attacks only deal one point of damage much to his surprise. Fung explains that it is resistant to damage as it has 95% damage reduction, so he should focus his mana usage on skills that would slow him down. With this advice, Hei uses the rooting spell he has, which makes the mech fall down, but it strangely also deals tons of damage to him. Fung notices and thinks that he must be weak against plant-based skills. Maybe they have a chance to defeat this thing. He tells everyone in the party to stop as that thing is weak to plant-based skills, so it's time for them to finally retaliate. He explains the plan, that being to just drag things out with Hei being in charge of dealing as much damage as he can with his plant-based skills, but not enough to pull aggro. Lonely is the first one to go in, and uses the Whirlwind Slash to spin the head of the mech, which confuses it and allows Hei to use the Binding Roots once again. The mech naturally goes after him next, but Cola is on it and uses a Divine Strike on the mech, which doesn't give it that much damage, but it attracts its attention enough to make it attack Cola, who even with his heavy defense he still receives tons of damage. Hei continues to attack while the mech chases after Cola, with Sloth trying his best to heal him. Seeing that the situation is dire, Fung charges in and attracts the boss's aggro with a few attacks. After the aggro pull is successful, Fung jumps high into the air using his gravity ring and slashes the rock around the ravine which makes some rocks fall on it, thus leaving it basically defeated. Seeing that the situation has taken a turn for the worse, the hazard goblin pops open the mech door, equips its jetpack and flies away from the scene. Seeing that the hazard goblin is trying to escape, Fung uses the power of the magical sword to try and hit him while thinking that monsters with such a level of intelligence are quite rare. The system must have a reason for making them so smart, so he will most definitely be rewarded for killing it. He sends the swords he has summoned flying, but the goblin manages to dodge them and uses the remaining fuel in his jetpack to escape. With that, Arcus Maddox has fled successfully. Fung is shocked to see that name, as Arcus Maddox will be a famous Grandmaster Engineer in this game and in only three years he will shock the world when he successfully creates the Sky Fortress Twin Snake Ring, which will bring him tons of fame and loot. Later, he will also create the Gnome Empire which will give start to one of the most famous expansions in God's Domain, Emergence of the New World. Fung is quite surprised that he nearly killed a future final boss and also denied the players an entire expansion. Sloth, who is looting the robot, announces that there's only one chest in the robot, and when Fung opens it, reveals that there's only two items inside. Arcus Maddox's key and a treasure map. Fung is still glad to have found these items, as the treasure map alone could potentially be worth this dangerous fight. He tells the group that there won't be any elite gnomes around to interrupt them from now on, so they should all stay here and continue farming, only leaving when they have reached level 4. Hay asks what he will do, and he explains that he has a treasure he must dig up. 900 years ago, the alchemy master Molotov used all of his power to create a treasure commonly known as the Philosopher's Stone. With this dangerous yet very powerful item, even common day to day, people could easily use alchemy and the elements to refine their work until it was perfect. Should this stone ever land in the hands of a true alchemist, they would be able to turn stone into the purest gold imaginable and even resurrect the dead. Once this item became known to the world, many countries in God's domain started to fight over who should own it. However, the Philosopher's Stone disappeared mysteriously during said war, becoming the biggest unsolved mystery in God's domain. After some very hard research by some diligent players, the stone was found to be hidden in the absolute depths of the Scarlet Lake in the Sun Temple and the key to opening its door was Arcus Maddox's treasure chest. Fung arrives at the Scarlet Lake which is a level 10 area and jumps in immediately, but what waits for him is a giant kraken-like beast, which he manages to dodge narrowly. He follows the treasure map until he finds a large opening that is seemingly protected by tons of siren guards, which are not easy to kill even with these numbers. Fung does not need to fight though, as he uses his shadow ability to lure them away, allowing him easy access to the cave where he finds a very large door. He pulls out the key, and it immediately fits the lock, which makes the door open to a large portal. He enters slowly and finds the Sun Temple with an unknown recommended level and two potentially dangerous guardians. Fung isn't scared of those two statues, however, and opens the chest that is standing on a podium. 
a powerful and bright light emits as he does this, but he is quite disappointed with the results, as the Philosopher's Stone is as small as a pebble. This is because this is only a fragment of the Philosopher's Stone, which still retains its alchemical conversion and elemental refinement skills, although in a much weaker state. Fung is still glad to have found even this, as with it. Forging will become a breeze for him in the foreseeable future. Suddenly the two guardian statues begin coming to life, and when they are fully animated it is revealed that they are both level 100. Fung wonders how he is supposed to defeat level 100 enemies so early, but it's clearly made this way as the Philosopher's Stone drops upon death, and these guys will force death upon the carried no matter what. Fung thinks that still the creators of God's domain aren't that ruthless and are somewhat fair, so they must have designed a way out. Fung then spots a transportation scroll on a dead NPC and rushes to it before the statues can hit him, using it to transport himself to Redleaf Town. Unfortunately for him, there's a loading timer for such a thing, and seeing that he is standing in the same place, one of the statues unleashes an extremely deadly beam at him. But the transportation completes in the nick of time, and Feng narrowly escapes death. The fishmen notice the rumbling from the attacks and deduce that the precious treasure of the Sun Temple has been stolen. They will now exact their revenge on mankind. That's when every player in the game receives a system notification that a player has triggered a special storyline, the Insurrection of the Fishmen. With it comes an expedition quest that can be received from the Adventurer's Guild, and it will reward them with tons of stuff along with reputation. This gets the player hyped up, as the server has just barely opened, yet there's an entire event happening. Joe wonders who was the player behind all of this progress, and White Snow notes that it must have surely been Fung who did all of this. Joe explains that the Crimson Lake is Fishman territory, so how did Fung get in alive when the enemies there are level 10 or higher? White Snow says that he not only got in, but he also managed to return alive, it seems. Fung sneezes while walking around, as someone seems to be talking about him quite a lot, but he doesn't have time to think about that, as he has arrived at the place he wanted to be at, the auction house. He is here because he wants to list off the excess equipment he obtained in the Deathly Forest on sale. The other players in the auction house notice that a few high-quality items have been put on sale, the likes of which they have never seen before. Fung also purchases stones and magic essence, as with the Philosopher's Stone he can turn them into ores, which will be an amazing profit for him. He begins purchasing tons of stones and magic essence, and the players that put these items on sale receive tons of notifications about. One of them notes that they should notify everyone and tell them to grind stones and magical essence to sell, while this rich guy is still around to purchase. This makes them wonder though, just who is that rich guy? Unfortunately for them, Fung is long gone, as he wants to test out the Philosopher's Stone powers. He rents a basic forging room for an hour, which he finds to be quite shabby as the tools are very bad and don't provide any bonuses, but he paid five copper for an hour, so he can't say it's not a good deal. He uses a common stone for refining, and with the Philosopher's Stone the probability of success is 20%. Even with that, the refining still fails. But Fung doesn't give up as he is sure that if he continues to try, he will eventually get some good ore. He refines and refines, but he keeps failing which leaves him with a pile of stone dust and a broken spirit. However, he did not notice that he managed to refine one of them into bronze ore, so his spirit is back, better than ever. His refining journey continues to be a story of ups and downs, until eventually he finishes the stones and ends up with 470 copper and 130 bronze ore. The forge rental he got expires, as he spent an entire hour refining. When he checks his cash to purchase another rental, Fung notices that he accidentally spent all of his cash on stones and magic essence. Fortunately, that's when his auction items sell. A piece of silver item for 31 silver and 53 copper, and a pair of dark boots for 3 silver and 21 copper. Fung is quite surprised that he got so much for a mysterious iron rank armor, but it seems that the people of this city are quite rich. He is not complaining at all though as not what his wallet is heavy. He doesn't need to save any more money. So he upgrades the small foraging room to basic forging room and rents it for two entire hours. When he arrives he finds a refinement hammer which increases forging success rate by 3% and a Scarlet Devil Fire that increases the success rate by 2%. Using the Book of Forging, Fung increases his chances of success even further, and so he tries crafting some garrison armor, which has a 60% success rate. With a smile, he raises the hammer, aligns the piece of ore perfectly, 
and begins hitting it again and again. Eventually, the piece of metal explodes in a bright light and the system rewards him with increased forging proficiency and 800 XP. The piece of garrison armor Fung has created has tons of good stats, but most importantly, it has the defensive tower attribute, which reduces physical damage on the wearer by 3%. He cannot believe that he managed to craft something so good on his first try. His luck really is crazy. This item is great on a tank, as it can increase his survivability. So big guilds that are raiding Deathly Forest will surely purchase this for a high price. Seeing that he is on a hot streak, Fung crafts and crafts until he is out of breath and without any crafting materials. In total, he made 23 sets of garrison armor within 2 hours and leveled up once as well. Now, it's time to sell these at the auction house. When he puts the up for purchase, the players that are there currently immediately jump on the offer, as some even have good attributes, so most of them get sold really quickly leaving Fung with a very nice profit. With nothing else to do, Fung decided to browse the auction too, and noticed that there are tons of rare skill books on sale, like Observing Eyes, which allows the user to see hidden and concealed targets, or Defensive Blade, that increase the attack range. He finds out through hearing that these were put by guild players that wanted to purchase the garrison armor for his guild, which the guildmaster congratulates him for, as his future will be bright if he continues to think about the guild like this. This is a golden opportunity for Fung, who will buy these skill books with pleasure, as they are very cheap. Surprisingly, he gets a call from White Snow, who notes that she needs some help with something. Fung is surprised that this famous Ice Queen is asking him for a favor, so he listens diligently. She wants 15 silver from him, as there's currently some good garrison armor on sale, and Ouroboros will have a much higher chance of success on the raids if they were to purchase it. She doesn't know who made them, but then asks just to be sure if this is not his doing. Fung sheepishly denies any involvement and closes the call while promising to give her the money. The price of the garrison armor continues to rise, and the guild member who sold his skill books tells the guildmaster that he got 13 pieces of silver, enough to get two pieces of armor. The guildmaster starts screaming at him. As the price has gone up, it's now nine pieces of silver per garrison armor. Fung retreats back to his forge, as he has upgraded it to an intermediate forging room and rented it for ten hours. He thinks that the money is there for him to earn, so he would be a fool not to seize the opportunity. Fung becomes consumed by his work to the point where he starts hallucinating and missing his blows. But this somehow creates a piece of unknown armor that has never been made before, which increases healing received by 10%. Fung thinks that he is truly blessed, as he cannot believe he was able to make a piece of original equipment. Original equipment cannot be simply found in the game world. It's created to player effort, which is why it's so rare. Fung adds his black flame imprint on it and names it Shimmering Chestplate. With this, nobody will be able to imitate the piece of armor, and anyone who sees the black flame imprint will know that it was forged by him. From now on, he will sell not only the chestplate, but also the blueprint for it, which should get him tons of money. The main reason Forge Masters were so sought after by guilds is because of their ability to create original equipment, which can provide tons of bonuses to their members. Even if the equipment's attributes are outclassed by new items, selling the blueprints will still make them tons of money. Fung can't believe such a highly improbable thing happened to him, but now, it's time to sell. He has created tons of armors, but more garrison armor, as the shimmering chestplate requires more materials. When Fung arrives to the auction, he notices that there are much fewer players than before, so he asks one of the players there what happened. He explains that a player named Deal Striker is selling bronze rank barbarian armor which has worse attributes than garrison armor, but it's only sold for 4 silver, so now everyone is flocking to that area. Fung seems to know about Deal Striker, as in his past life he was the first to discover the Forge Master's hidden quest, and due to this, his name spread throughout, eventually landing him a position at the Shadow Workshop. He was also the one who heavily recommended that he should be removed from the Shadow Workshop all for the sake of obtaining a higher status in that damn guild. If he can think of anyone as his nemesis, it must definitely be this guy. Fung also gets a forum push notification, explaining that as a forger with a good reputation, he can confirm that the materials for the barbarian armor are only 2 silver, and with a success rate of 50%. He believes that 4 silver is an adequate price. However, that other bad forger is putting his items for 5 silver. Truly the world has gone to hell. Feng is quite mad that he was called a bad forager, as this guy is clearly trying to pull all of his sales. 
If he thinks about it now though, the server was opened super recently so the item prices are high and the fluctuations are good. Deal Striker is just increasing his renown by selling so low, but if he thought that it would be over because of this, he is dead wrong. He puts all of his original pieces at 4 silver and starts faking a reaction. A new batch of shimmering chest plates has appeared in the auction and it's a fixed price of 4 silver. What a beautiful design. What powerful shimmer. Truly, this is a piece to be remembered. The other players notice that this is much better than the rather ugly barbarian armor, so they get to purchase it and everyone who's anyone starts purchasing it. At the Forging Association of the Golden Sand Town, everyone is purchasing the barbarian armor that Deal Striker has purchased. While he is sitting on a sofa with a beauty, he explains that various higher-ups from tons of guilds are waiting for him outside, like they are his direct subordinates. They all want him in their guilds, which has become quite annoying. The woman asks why not join the strongest guild, and he notes that the ones that are outside are just run-of-the-mill guilds. None of them are worth joining. Now, all he needs to do is trample on that mysterious forager who thought he could steal his popularity and everything will be good. However, the thing he is looking forward to the most is when his name spreads around the entire region, and guilds like Shadow will give him anything he wants in order to make him join them. What a good life. Suddenly, one of his subordinates rushes into his room and announces that everyone has suddenly left. When he goes to check, sure enough, there's only a dog who has done his business on the floor. The subordinate explains that shimmering chest plates that are set at four silver have appeared in the auction. The guilds are no longer interested in working with him at all. In a messy room, which is Deal Striker's home, he throws his headset on the ground and says that the guy who is challenging him is extremely dumb, as the materials he has are quite expensive, so now he is making a huge loss. Seeing that this is a battle of attrition, he goes on his computer and asks a third-party seller how much bronze and iron ores go for at the moment. The seller says that bronze ore is 50 credit points, and iron ore is 100 credits apiece. Even if he does not have the money, Deal Striker decided to take a gamble and borrow as he can easily pay off any debt when he joins a top guild and still have tons of money to enjoy himself with. He calls the seller and asks him to give him 10,000 credit points worth of each ore. With that out of the way, he also posts on the forum, noting that he will fight the wicked forged until the bitter end and sell all of his items at one silver, excluding barbarian armor, which will be priced at three silver. Fung sees that this guy just doesn't want to give up, but he won't either, and so he chooses to also lower the prices. Everyone in the auction house notices that the prices keep going down one after another, and some choose to wait, as the prices will surely go down again, which will give them the best bargain there is. Deal Striker gets informed that the forger he is battling with has lowered his prices too, as now, his shimmering chest plates are priced at a fixed three silver. Deal Striker starts to go crazy, but still decides to lower the prices, as he will make that bastard go bankrupt if need be. With that, Barbarian armor is now 2 silver and 30 copper. Fung isn't too scared of this, as this is not the only way he can fight this guy. When the blueprints he crafted will become available, large guilds will be able to train their own forgers with it, and nobody will come to him for his worthless pieces of armor. Eventually, news about the blueprints for the shimmering plates being sold gets to Deal Striker, who cannot do anything at this point, as he clenches his chest tight and leaves the game afterwards. He has been completely defeated, News about Deal Striker and how he basically gave up on the auction spread around, with one of the people saying that his brother's friend is Deal Striker's subordinate, and it seems that he was sent to the hospital because of shock. Fung overhears a conversation about this and hopes that the Deal Striker has learned his lesson from now on, as he does not want to give him another lesson like this. Suddenly, a girl is thrown to the ground by a man who says that she is extremely dumb. Is she really trying to make money by selling iced beverages in a damn game? This man is named Drifting Blood, and he says that he has given her his address. She should come so that he can teach her how to make money easily, step by step. Someone from the public calls him a shameless pig, who can only bully girls. But he eats his words as Drifting Blood snatches his scarf and pulls him closer. If he wants to, he will give him a chance to be the knight in shining armor that saves the princess. But everything comes at a price, so if he lets that girl go now, he will kill him again and again, until he is back to level zero. The man retracts his words, and Drifting Blood warns the other spectators too. If they think of themselves as heroes, they should come forward. As this offer is extended to everyone, the girl, who goes by Violet Cloud, calls him a rotten bastard. Fung seems to remember that name as she will become one of the greatest this game has ever seen. If that is the case, he will have to teach this fat guy a lesson, 
as there's connections to be made. At the very beginning of God's domain, Violet Cloud was a cleric in Ouroboros that was weak, and nobody knew of her. After the Ice Queen, Gentle Snow, left Ouroboros, Violet Cloud also decided to quit, which allowed her to advance from a Tier 4 Great Cleric to a Tier 5 Brilliant Cleric Saint. In the end, she reached the very peak of her class, becoming a Tier 6 Cleric God and one of the 10 greatest clerics known to this game. Unlike most legends in this game, who had the full support of their respective guilds, Violet Cloud did all of this alone and through her hard work. Feng picks up one of her beverages and drinks it, noting that it has a pleasant taste. Drifting Blood asks if he really wants to be the hero in this situation, as he will beat him up like there's no tomorrow. In a split second, Feng gets behind him and tells him to try, if he can, that is. He grabs his shoulder and pushes him to the ground with a single hand while also mocking him for his lack of strength. All bark, no bite, right? The others are very surprised when they see how strong Feng is, as he pushed a Berserker class down and one of them warns him to be careful, as players are not allowed to fight in here so an NPC will come to detain him. Feng tells them not to worry, as he is only pushing him down using his strength. This shouldn't be considered an attack, because he's not using any attack skills. Drifting blood, having had enough of this, he pounds the ground with a skill, and then pulls his sword out to attack Feng, who defends himself quite easily. Drifting blood backs away for a bit, allowing Feng to mock him once again, as it seems that he doesn't have that much strength. Did he perhaps not have enough to eat? With even greater rage, Drifting Blood charges in to finish Feng off with a single attack. Unfortunately for him, an NPC guard gets in front of Feng and announces that because he is attacking another player in this area, he will be locked away for 12 hours. While being dragged off by the guard, Drifting Blood promises to make Feng's life a living hell. The Martial Union will not forget this no matter what. Violet Cloud thanks Feng for the timely rescue and she would love to repay him in any way, but she is a newbie and doesn't have that much money to begin with. Feng just looks at her in silence for a second, which makes her blush and say that her body is off limits. She only sells refreshments. Feng is quite surprised by what she thought of without him saying anything and gives her a deposit, noting that he was looking for a cook and she seems to be a good fit. This is just her salary in advance. Violet Cloud is naturally surprised by this and asks if cooking is really the only thing he will have her do. Feng notes that she has two choices, either keep getting harassed in the streets like this or follow him. It's entirely her choice. Violet Cloud chooses to accept the offer, and Feng suggests that with the money she got, she should go buy any recipes and ingredients she needs. Also, she should rent a kitchen, so that nobody will be able to bother her again. He turns to leave, but before he can, she asks why he is treating her so well. Feng notes he hired her because he saw how diligent she truly is. With that, he leaves, with Violet Cloud promising to do a good job from now on. Feng thinks that for now, he will let her practice some life skills or anything she wants. When she lets her guard down, he will guide her into a life of leveling up and battling. He bought a godly cleric with a single gold coin. He really must be a sort of genius. After this, he goes back to the slums, as he has a diary that was dropped by the werewolf boss. But it is written in the elven language, so he needs a librarian to decipher it. Still, he cannot believe that they built a library in this place where criminal activity is the highest, which makes him wonder what kind of person the library manager really is. Suddenly, a woman calls him over, as he looks like he's new here, so she will show him around, and potentially give him a night he can't hope to forget. Fung feels that this is some sort of trap, and even if he wants to go, his consciousness will not let him. Seeing that he is just standing in place, the woman signals the ambushers to attack, who jump high into the air and aim straight for Fung's head. Unfortunately for them, Fung notices their presence a long time ago, so he easily takes care of them with a few slashes. The woman is surprised by how good he is, and notes that he has earned a reward. He should tell her where he wants to go, as she knows this place like the back of her hand, and will point him in the right direction. Fung says that he doesn't need any piece of information, as he already knows the way to the library. The woman tells him that it's a coincidence then, as nobody knows that place better than her. With a single snap of her fingers, she reverts back into her original form, the Holy Sister Charlene and the librarian of this place. Fung is quite surprised by her sudden transformation, as she looked like a criminal just a second ago. But can he really trust this lady? Seeing that he is not fully convinced yet, Charlene snaps her fingers once again, and the empty area around them transforms into the library which Fung wanted to visit. Fung looks around and thinks that this place looks more like a haunted attraction than a library. 
Sharlin gets comfortable and asks what the purpose of his visit might be. Fung pulls out the elven book and explains that he wanted this deciphered, as it's written in ancient elvish. Nothing in this world is free, so she asks him for thirty silver, which he reluctantly gives, even though he heard that nuns aren't supposed to be covetous. She gets to reading it, but soon she finds something shocking and throws the book away as it emits a dark green light. When the book falls to the ground, a gigantic great demon phantom appears out of it, with an unknown level. Charlin quickly tries to seal him, which he finds very insulting, as a mere divine official like her will not be able to. She in turn notes that he is just a lowly phantom. Does he really have what it takes to brag like this? She strikes him in the chest with a divine spear but he breaks it with his bare hands and it seems that it did not damage him that much. Seeing this, Charlin begins casting an even larger spell which the demon knows about, but he cannot do anything to defend himself. The divine light hits the demon fully, but he is not dead yet, and promises to meet Fung soon enough. While he retreats back into the book, the system warns Fung that he has been cursed by a greater demon, so all of his attributes are reduced by 50%, and experience he gets is reduced by 95%. Additionally, the phantom of the great demon will come for him in 90 days and attempt to possess his body fully. Charlin cannot believe that the diary was hiding a phantom of a great demon, but more importantly, she can't believe that she only asked for 30 silver. What a blunder! Fung is quite shocked by everything, as this is the last thing he expected to get from the diary. Charlin tells him that he's quite lucky actually, as if he had kept that thing on him for a few more days, his body would have been stolen without him being able to do anything. Fung says that the problem isn't solved though, as the demon will be coming for him in 90 days. She explains that the diary has the incantation he needs to unlock the dark cave's gate. All he needs to do is just find the book of darkness that is inside, as she will then destroy it to prevent the demon from coming here ever again. With that, Fung receives the epic quest Darkness Descends, where he must destroy the Book of Darkness, but the rewards are unknown. Fung remembers about this quest and the guy who did it, Fantasy Extinguisher, but he never revealed anything about the quest. He asks Charlin where the Dark Cave might be, just a small hint will be good enough. She explains that he will have to pay 10 gold for that kind of information. She knows that he can't possibly have that much on him now so she will graciously help him remove the great demon curse that is on him first, and then work him for the money later. A good deal, isn't it? Fung laments having met such a greedy holy person, and asks if breaking the curse will also cost him, even though he feels like it will. Charlin congratulates him for being so smart. Indeed, the ritual that breaks the curse will be three gold. Anyway, he should take this teleportation orb as it can take him to Moonlight Forest, where he will collect 30 moonstones, once he has those, she will be able to perform the ritual on him. The Moonlight Forest is a level 9 area, and Fung is also cursed, so he buys tons of potions just to be safe. With these, his chances of survival are much bigger. With everything set up, Fung uses the orb and teleports to the Moonlight Forest, where he is eager to start. The Moonlight Forest is a level 9 area, where the drop rate from the monsters is very high. Additionally, Rare resources and ores also can be found here. Due to all of these, low-level players roam around here for treasure, which mostly gets them killed. As a result of this constant slaughter, this place is known to players as the Land of Death. Fung is too low for this area, and with the curse he has cast on him, this place is a walking game over screen. Fortunately, he has thought of this before coming here, so he uses an isolation scroll on himself, which decreases a player's presence and allows the player to go into stealth mode. This effect lasts for 30 whole minutes. With this effect and his great agility, Fung easily sneaks past all kinds of monsters without being spotted at all. He continues to run until he finds a spot with tons of moonstones, so he stops to grab them, but while he is doing that he spots a patrol party, which he identifies as a mountain beast warrior party. If they are here, it means that their camp must be nearby, which has a very high chance of treasure chests spawning in it. This is a potential gold mine, as the treasure chests drop the best loot, and he is positive that no other players have entered the Moonlight Forest yet. This is a chance for him to get everything he can without any sort of competition. Eventually, he finds the warrior camp, where they seem to be hard at work carrying a sort of ore. Fung draws himself closer, and spots a few workers carrying some crates in a tent. That must be the warehouse. The only logical place for treasure chests would be in there, but unfortunately, the stealth effect he has will not work on the mountain beast warriors in silver armor that are guarding the warehouse. If he wants the treasure, he needs to get rid of these guys.
but the other monsters will notice if he were to attack now. Fung sits around for a while and notices that one of them left to refresh himself with a soup that is just sitting over the fire. Naturally, this gives Fung a grand idea, so he approaches the soup slowly. When he gets to it, he notices how stinky it is, but no matter, as little iron beer will add some good flavor to it. After a while, everyone in the camp is passed out drunk due to the beer, which allows Fung to enter the warehouse, which is full of chests and loot. The first chest he opens gives him 8 silver 14 moonstone and a silver moon helmet, which has tons of defense and other very useful stats. Fung is very glad to have found this, as it's a very useful piece of armor, and if he can gather the entire set, he will get even more attribute bonuses from it. He prays to God for the next chest to also have a piece of silver moon equipment, just like the helmet, but instead, he gains the Ring of Nothingness, which has the Shadow of Nothingness, allowing him to go stealth mode. Fung is extremely glad to have found such a treasure, but unfortunately for him, one of the guards sobers up and enters the warehouse with murderous intent. Fung notes that he shouldn't have awakened now, and without much choice, he uses a sheep polymorph scroll worth 50 silver to save himself. This allows him to get out of the warehouse unseen. After the warehouse guard transforms back, he can only scream, as Fung is long gone. With the ring he has, Fung thinks that it's a grand idea to loot all of the treasure chests in the Moonlight Forest, which will give him an unimaginable profit. With the power of the ring in his hands, Fung easily loots tons of chests, and even when he's discovered, he uses the polymorph scrolls he has to turn his enemies into worthless sheep. He does this tons of times, until he finishes searching all of the chests in the Moonlight Forest. He thinks that he got tons of great rewards from these treasure chests, while also collecting all the moonstones he needed to lift this ugly curse. On top of all this great loot, he also got a full set of Silver Moon equipment, so he cannot wait to get rid of this curse and equip it to test it out. That's when he notices something extremely precious has dropped from one of the treasure chests, but he did not expect it at all, as this item shouldn't be in such a low-level area. Either way, future quests will now be at least three times easier if he has this. Eventually, Fung makes his way back to the library using the teleportation orb, which surprises Sharlin, as she did not expect him to arrive so fast. Did he really get all of the moonstones they need? Fung approaches her and gives her everything that she has asked for, including some gold, and asks if they can start dispelling the curse now. Sharlin explains that dispelling the curse is not the only thing she can do, as Moondrip is a very ancient ritual. He can upgrade its power if he pays three additional gold coins. Then she will get the ingredients they need and perform the full moon drip ritual, which will remove his curse, while also granting tons of additional buffs and benefits. Fung feels like she is trying to swindle him of a few more gold coins, so he chooses to remain at the low-grade moon drip ritual. She tells him to not reject so instantly, as he most likely does not know the legend of the demon-slaying sword saint Celsius. Charlin explains that the legend says the legendary Celsius was cursed by the great demon king. He was under his torment for a long while. She kicks the music box around because it broke, and the dramatic effect of her story is gone, but continues nonetheless. After Celsius experienced tons of hardships with this curse, he discovered a method to dispel the curse, the full moon drip ritual. After undoing the curse, Celsius seemed to obtain a whole new life, and in addition, he received strength that even a peerless swordmaster would envy, which allowed him to slay the demon king and become the legendary sword saint, on the God's Domain continent. All he needs to receive this power is three more gold, for a total of five gold for the complete ritual. Rather reluctantly, Fung accepts her offer, as he would bet three gold any time if it meant a chance to become like the Sword Saint in the future. They go to the ritual place, where Fung asks if there's any danger to this ritual. Charlin tells him to calm down, as even if this is her first time doing this ritual, even her superior praised her talents, so it should be rather easy. With that, she begins the ritual with some hand movements, but it seems she has forgotten the words for it, so she pulls out a book to rehearse them once again, which makes Fung wonder if she really is capable of conducting the ritual, or he got scammed. Eventually she begins conducting the ritual, and shortly after, Fung begins vomiting up the curse he was infected with, which eventually takes shape, as his evil doppelganger, who calls him a pathetic human, who will never be able to be free of his control, even if he somehow manages to remove the curse from his body. Charlin, while still conducting the ritual, tells Fung that this is just an illusionary clone created by the demon, 
he will break the curse that was cast on him if he defeats it. The doppelganger charges in and attempts to strike Fung, who can barely block the attack which creates a large green explosion around them. Charlin tells Fung that the doppelganger has all of his attributes, but isn't affected by the curse so he will die if he fights head on like this. Sure enough, the doppelganger pushes him back, which confirms to Fung that this guy is twice as strong as he is. The doppelganger pushes him down once again, while telling him to yield under his blade, as he promises to give him strength beyond anything he has seen before. He will no longer be limited by his pathetic human body. Fung refuses, as he does not wish to become his puppet. Fung is pushed back constantly, and eventually the doppelganger uses the thundering slash ability to deal with him once and for all. Without half of his stats, Fung cannot hope to dodge the very large attack, so he is hit fully by it, which leaves him with only a sliver of HP. Seeing his pathetic state, the doppelganger chooses to kill him without any remorse. But suddenly, his blade stops in between Fung's eyes, as he has activated a magic circle around him. The doppelganger can't move anymore, so the flow of the battle is now in Fung's hands. Back in the Moonlight Forest, what Fung found that surprised him was a divine circle scroll, a light magic that will eradicate all evil in this world. It increases the caster's attributes by 100%, and binds the target for 5 seconds while reducing their attributes by 50%, with this effect being doubled against evil. While he was holding back the doppelganger, Fung used his shadow close to place the scroll down and set it up to its max range. He is glad he was actually able to do it, as he nearly died in the process. But still, he feels a little bad about the scroll, as he had to waste it on something like this right after receiving it. The doppelganger thinks that this is utter mockery, but without being able to retaliate, Fung easily strikes him down. Before disappearing, the doppelganger tells him that it will not end here, and that they will surely meet again. After everything is said and done, the system congratulates him for completing the Moondrip quest. It rewards him with 10,000 XP, reputation with the Star Moon Kingdom, White River City, and Red Leaf Town, which is enough for him to become a third-class noble of Red Leaf Town. Additionally, he also gains the Demon Hunter title, which gives his demonic enemies 10% reduced attributes and 10% more damage taken. Besides all of these generous rewards, he also gains a demon mask, which lets him disguise himself as anyone else, and the effect cannot be broken unless a high-level observation skill is used. Fung thinks that all of the gold he has invested in this operation has paid off well, as with this, he can truly be the Black Flame Blacksmith. Nobody will ever know that they are actually the same person, Charlin says that the ritual was completed successfully, so the curse will no longer affect him. While catching her breath, Fung asks if she's alright, which makes her open a portal and say that the ritual has weakened her quite a bit, so she will go rest. If he needs her again, he knows where to find her. This portal reminds Fang of the graveyard dungeon raid he promised to White Snow, which he promised he would come to, so he should get to leveling as fast as he can. He arrives back in the Red Leaf Town Square, where players talk about the guilds that exchange in-game currency for real money, with the exchange rate being favorable to the players. One could get 600 credits just from a single silver coin. One of the players even sold all of his equipment for credits, so he is now naked, but he can feed himself for two entire months off the cash he made. While Fung checks out all of the attribute boosts he will get from equipping the Silver Moon set, Drifting Blood seems to have gotten his boss and he tells him that this guy took out tons of silver coins just a few days ago, so he is loaded. The boss, who goes by Ironsword Lion, tells him to pay up, as he has heard that he hit his subordinate, which will not go unpunished. Fung remembers his name, as this guy was an expert in a Wuxia VR game, but that game had to shut down, so he was forced to move to God's Domain as a result. However, even in this game, it did not take him long for him to form the Martial Union and become really powerful. In his past life, he killed Flaming Tiger alone twice, and even Heartstabber of the Assassin Alliance was pushed back against this beast. Now though, he has the Abyssal Blade and the Silver Moon set, so there is no reason for him to fear this weakling. He chooses to walk away while ignoring them and focusing on his system tab, but Drifting Blood tells him to stop right this second as he must pay for what he did. Fung asks who he is, but then remembers that he's the weirdo that was harassing Violet Cloud. He's kind of surprised they let him out of the prison so quickly, but did he make any friends there? Drifting Blood wants to charge him once again, but Ironsword Lion tells him to mind his manners, as he should not sully the Union's name any further. Everyone gathers to see what's going around and Ironsword tells Fang that they are not bullies, 
but he has beaten his subordinate so they will call it even if he coughs over 20 silver coins. He can choose to refuse, but he shouldn't blame them for ganging up on him if he does. One of the players in the crowd wonders how Feng got the Marshall Union's attention, and another player next to him explains that drifting blood of the Union harassed a female player. So Feng taught him a nice lesson. One of the Assassin Alliance members asks Heartstabber if they should interfere, as Ironsword Lion is already level 5 and has tons of great equipment already. Heartstabber notes that they shouldn't hurry with this decision, as they will only make a move if the situation calls for it. That will make their help much more valuable to Feng. However, he also wants to see how Feng chooses to settle the situation. Feng pulls out a bag of 50 silver coins and says that 25 is too little so he will give him these. Ironsword immediately folds at the sight of money and asks to exchange contacts with him since he is so rich and smart. Drifting Blood says that he still hasn't gotten over his money grubbing habits, which makes Ironsword hit him in the head. He explains that considering his amazing sincerity, he will protect him in the future. So if anyone dares to bully him, they will be up against the Marshall Union from this moment forth. He gives Fung a trade request while having a big smile, but suddenly Fung uses his abyssal bind on him and his expression changes to a sadistic grin. Before Ironsword can even attempt to escape, Fung cuts him down to size and kills him. Heartstabber is surprised by the amount of speed Fung has, but one of the members says that he killed someone in the safe zone. This will not go unpunished by the NPC. Fung asks if there's anyone else who wishes to have these 50 silver coins, which spooks the other Marshall Union members, but they are left assured as they know that he was too arrogant this time. Killing someone in a safe zone will make the guards punish him for a while. Eventually a guard does indeed arrive, and Drifting Blood runs to him like a damsel in distress. He falls to his knees and cries while explaining that Fung has killed his boss without any provocation, so they should lock him up for life. Drifting Blood thinks that this bastard is done for, as he will drop an entire level and also be locked up for 24 hours at least. After that, he will be considered a lower class citizen, and he will not get any of the privileges that he had up until now. The guard addresses him as Lord Demon Hunter and notes that even if he's a noble, he did indeed kill a man. According to the Redleaf Town laws, he will have to pay a fine of four silver coins or be escorted to prison should he refuse. Drifting Blood is amazed that this guy is a noble, as nobles enjoy tons of special privileges in God's domain, and demon hunters are also considered nobles wherever they go. If a civilian player dares to provoke a noble, they will be imprisoned at best or executed at worst. On the contrary, guards will just not care if a noble beats up a civilian player in a safe zone. The difference in status in this game is truly worlds apart. Fung hands the guard 20 silver coins, as he is going to kill four additional players, and he would like to pay up front. The other Marshall Union players know what this means, so they get to running while the players around laugh at their cowardice. White Snow and her raid members are busy with the graveyard dungeon raid, as they are now dealing with a gigantic boss with two heads. They all work in unison as much as they can with the damage dealers killing any weaker monsters, while the tanks attract the boss's attention. However, even the most expert of damage dealers can make mistakes, and one such mistake was made, which leaves one of their damage dealers at the monster's mercy. However, the legendary White Snow is in this raid party, and she instantly takes care of the monster. She tells the damage dealer to take a rest if she does not have enough stamina, as she will become a liability for the group if she cannot defend herself. With that out of the way, she charges through countless undead brutes, striking each one with high speed and damage. To clear the area even faster, she uses a large area of attack skill, which cuts every single brute in a range into pieces. Suddenly, the boss starts using a large skill, which comes as a breath attack which comes from both heads. White Snow tells everyone to stay vigilant, as when that attack is finished, the boss will be vulnerable so their long-range damage dealers should attack now. They all do just that, and their attacks land just in time for the boss to finish his attack. With the boss defeated, White Snow asks how many people they lost. In total, they lost five people including their main tank, two melee damage dealers, and one long-range damage dealer, with a healer also being killed at the very end. She tells everyone to clean up the battlefield of any loot and take a break, as in 10 minutes, they will go to the Physis Canyon and continue pushing forward. Out of nowhere, a blue portal appears, which makes everyone stand on guard. But out of it comes a man, who apologizes for disturbing them, but he is Black Flame. Naturally, this is actually Fung, who can now use portals to transport himself directly to his friends because he is nobility, so this should add a sense of mystery to his alter ego. 
Some players recognize that name, as he is the godly forger who caused Deal Striker to quit the game entirely. Black Flame recognizes White Snow and notes that it's a pleasure to meet her in person. He has heard that Ouroboros is recruiting right now, so he came here to talk to her about them cooperating. White Snow notes that indeed Ouroboros is lacking a chief forger, so if he is willing to take up that position, they will pay him as much as he wants to be paid. Xiao pulls her closer and asks how she knows that he really is the Black Flame Forger. Has she forgotten what happened when they tried to recruit the fake Black Flame Forgers? They took all of them to a forging room filled with materials, but by the end, the materials in the storage room had been wasted, and none of the fake Black Flames were able to produce even a single shimmering chestplate. White Snow says that she shouldn't worry, as this guy appeared before them in a very mysterious way, so he is definitely an expert at least. Black Flame tells her that she is mistaken about something, as he only wishes to work with Ouroboros as an equal. But if they want him to become a part of their guild, he will have to refuse and take his leave. Joe tells him that he is truly arrogant, as in order to even attempt to cooperate with their guild on equal footing, he must at least represent a top guild like them. White Snow agrees, as there are not many people in this game that can negotiate with them, let alone solo players. So what makes him think that he is any different? Black Flame pulls out tons of advanced forging designs, which surprised both of them, and asks if he's qualified to negotiate with them now. Joe asks where he managed to get so many advanced forging designs, but he notes that it's a trade secret, which he unfortunately can't divulge to her. Two hours ago, Fung went to the Hammerstone Town in the Dwarven Bar and met with Blackbeard, who asked if he had any refreshing drinks, as he will gladly exchange his treasure for them. Thus, Fung obtained the Blackbeard's request quest, which is repeatable, and all he needs to do is bring five ice drinks to him. Fung gave him five refreshing drinks that he got from Violet Cloud, which Blackbeard thoroughly enjoyed, and gave him 10 copper, 250 XP, and five favorability with Blackbeard. After he was done drinking, he wondered when he would get to drink such delicious juice again, but Fung had stocked up on juice beforehand, and by the end, he gained 3,400 copper and 85,000 XP. He also gained tons of favorability with him, which awarded him with Blackbeard's key and 10 advanced forging designs. Not only did Fung reach level 5 because of this quest, but he also got his hands on these precious advanced forging designs and the secret Blackbeard key reward, which is the source behind all of these designs in the first place. White Snow ponders the offer for a bit and comes to the conclusion that she cannot let such a peerless blacksmith work with other guilds, so she accepts his terms, which comes as a surprise to everyone. Unfortunately for her, Black Flame is no longer interested due to their rudeness beforehand. White Snow bows her head down in shame and apologizes, as she did not mean what she said earlier, and she would like for him to reconsider their deal once again. Joe asks why she is bowing before him, as he is just a blacksmith, one of many in fact, they can always go to another. White Snow says that they have all but confirmed that this man is the real Black Flame, so with his help, their guild will definitely rise to the number one stop in all of God's domain. Seeing that she is willing to bow down, Black Flame turns around and notes that she has her head screwed on straight, so he is willing to work with them and provide the Ouroboros Guild with the best equipment, for the right price naturally. White Snow shakes hands to signal that the deal has been made and sincerely hopes that their relationship will be as strong as the metal he forges. She also notices that his hands feel familiar in some way, but lets it go as it's probably nothing of importance. She also notes that their party is now going to farm in the Physis Canyon. Would he like to join them, perhaps? Black Flame agrees, as he happens to have a quest that needs to be completed there, that quest being from the Blackbeard's Key, which will open a chest in the canyon that will provide him with the Titan's heart. White Snow thinks that it's great he accepted the offer, as now she will be able to see just how powerful he really is. The other players in the party wonder why he even joined, as he is only a blacksmith, so they are sure he will be useless and embarrass himself in front of everyone soon enough. Eventually they arrive in the Physis Canyon, where tons of harpies are gathered and are looking at the players below with lots of attention. One of their tanks notes that he read on the forum about a player who encountered the harpies. He told everyone that they lift people high into the sky and drop them on the ground in order to kill them with the heavy fall damage. Black Flame tells them to not worry so much, as if their movement doesn't suck, they will not be caught and the harpies will prove to be harmless. The female melee damage dealer notes that he's just a dumb blacksmith. What does he know about being on the battlefield? 
Suddenly, she is grabbed by a harpy and screams to be saved, which makes Black Flame say that the harpies choose their targets based on sound, so her incessant screaming will prove to be her downfall. One of the other damage players tries to save the kidnapped girl, but he simply cannot match the harpy's rising speed, so he falls to the ground and apologizes because he cannot get to her. As a last resort, Joe unleashes a flame burst near the damage dealer lady, which does get rid of the harpy, but it makes her fall down from a great height. Fortunately for her, this was not enough to kill her, and she manages to survive with only a sliver of HP. Joe calls her quite pathetic, but the damage dealer lady puts the blame on the Black Flame Forger, as he was the one who was distracting her all of this time. Without any respite, another harpy rushes in to snatch the blacksmith from behind, but he has already noticed her presence for a while, so he easily turns around and cuts one of her wings off, sending her flying towards the damage dealer lady, who can only dodge at this point. The blacksmith looks at her and says that it was a piece of cake, which makes her angry, as he was just lucky. That is why he even managed to cut her wing off. Once again, her needless screaming attracts the attention of the harpies, and one immediately jumps on her but this time she manages to dodge, allowing Black Flame to easily take care of the harpy from behind, which drops a few pieces of gold. He sheathes his sword while everyone else just watches in shock. White Snow thinks that she has only seen Fung using such nice sword skills previously. Is this person really just a forger and nothing else like he says? Black Flame asks the damage dealer lady why she is so shocked, as she should pick up the loot since he wants to continue moving forward already. Joe looks above, and can't believe that he actually managed to scare the harpies off like this. Will she be lucky enough to meet another powerful person like Fung? Eventually they arrive at the fallen meteorite lands, where a bunch of mechanical puppets and knights are waiting for them, which makes White Snow ask Black Flame what kind of quest he has that makes him go into such a dangerous area. He explains that it is a hidden quest that will allow him to retrieve the Titan's heart. White Snow notes that on average their team is around level 6. Going up against level 9 monsters like these is no different than seeking a full party wipe at this point. To ensure that they will not incur tons of casualties, they will defeat all of these monsters one by one. She tells Joe that she is in charge of luring the enemies in with magic. After that, their shield warrior will take the aggro, and they can slay the monster together. She agrees, but Black Flame tells her to wait, which makes Joe angrily ask if he's doubting her strength. Black Flame explains that mechanical monsters like these have much higher speed than biological creatures, so if their agility is not on par, they will not be able to outrun even one. Is there anyone here that has their agility above 14? Only a few people have their agility at 14 or above, including White Snow and the Damage Dealer Lady. Black Flame notes that they will stack agility buffs on White Snow and the Damage Dealer Lady, whose name is Little Song, and they will lure all of the mechanical monsters at the periphery to one location with their high amounts of speed. The rest they can leave to him. White Snow agrees with his plan, but she does not need that speed control at all. She jumps in right in the middle of the group of mechanical beasts and notes that they will not be able to catch her. Sure enough, White Snow is too fast to be caught, and Little Song also manages to keep up with her speed. Thus they both drag all of the mechanical enemies to Black Flame, which makes Joe wonder what he will do against so many monsters. He pulls out a flaming scroll and places it on the ground, with Joe instantly feeling that it's a powerful spell. When Black Flame unleashes the scroll, a sword appears and is engulfed in flame. Both White Snow and Little Song run past him, which allows him to use the second tier magic, the Flame Blade Barrage. Lots of fireballs appear above Black Flame, and he unleashes all of them on the mechanical enemies, who cannot hope to defend themselves against such a high amount of power. These strikes even send some of the players behind Black Flame flying, due to the amount of power it has. After the attack is over, not a single mechanical enemy was left alive, and Black Flame's level increases, with the others in the party also leveling up to level 7. He gives them all of the dropped loot, as it is much weaker than what he can forge, so he has no need for it. White Snow explains that they have originally planned to grind out levels slowly, but they managed to get one level instantly thanks to his efforts. She doesn't know how to thank him for this. Black Flame tells her that thanks is not necessary, as they have already helped him get to this place safely anyway. She also says that it would be too risky for her squad to continue past this point. So from now on, he must proceed alone. Black Flame tells her that it is not a problem. They have already helped plenty. He can take care of himself from now on. Additionally, they should take these city teleportation scrolls he had on him, as they will help them get back faster. Joe comes around and invites him to the level 5 co-op dungeon they will be raiding tomorrow, and White Snow agrees that with him, 
their chances of success would increase a ton. Black Flame turns around and says that he will be pretty busy from now on so they can discuss that later. Joe doesn't give up however and sends him a friend request, which he instantly rejects, as he doesn't need more attention attracted to himself. Eventually Fung arrives at the place he needed to be and uses Blackbeard's key to open the door, which does so rather slowly. Suddenly, a few mechanical guards appear, but Fung moves swiftly to get inside of the vault, which closes behind him when he does. Finally, he has entered and discovered the steel fortress, Baruchia. This place is a level 11 place, and the system also changes the mission. Now it's to find the heart of steel inside of this place. Fung still decides to go in, as higher levels have not stopped him from venturing out before. He does just that, and arrives at a smelting area. He uses the gravity ring to float, and gets into a small crevice, which holds a sizable chest. The moment he touches it, however, the explosion spell that was cast on the chest activates and Fung blows up. Fortunately, this was just his shadow clone, as he likes to be very meticulous when it comes to searching, since this game is known to be very weird when it comes to setting up traps. Inside of the chest, there are a few things. A blackstone shield which has tons of good stats, including a passive that negates damage by 10%, but Fung also finds a random mastery dice, which upon throwing it, the player will obtain the corresponding number of master points in a random attribute. Fung notes that gamblers are huge fans of this thing, and many people would pay tons of cash to buy these things in his past life. He could sell it, but he is really not short on cash, so he might as well keep it to himself and see if he is lucky. He throws the dice and it lands on a natural 20, which gives him 20 attribute points in one-handed sword efficiency. Now he has 40. Truly, nobody can compete with this luck. He also gets a few resistance scrolls but suddenly hears something sinister, so he decides to not linger around this place any longer. He jumps in a body of water and comes up to the core region, but unfortunately, his VR helmet trial period is about to end. Fung finds it sad that even after so much effort he could push further. But well, this should be enough for now, as he has gathered more than enough credits to do what he wanted to do. With that, he logs out. Outside of the game, Hay is being interrogated by one of the apartment residents, as he said that he was an expert at the game, but he has been waiting for him in the shadow workshop for several days already. Why has he not seen him, huh? Hay says to Yi that he has already joined another studio, so he did not go for the shadow workshop's sign-up like he originally planned to. Yi calls him a liar, as there are no other studios at Jinhai University. If he's not lying, what is the studio's name? Hay cannot say because he literally doesn't know as Fung did not tell him the name of the workshop, unfortunately. Yi notes that it's okay for him to say that he didn't pass the sign-up trial. There is no need to hide it like this. If things won't work out, he will help as making him a tertiary member will not be a problem for someone like him, with tons of prestige. Yi also notices that he only has a trial helmet here, so it means that his workshop must be in trouble. Since he is so generous and malevolent, he will let him join the shadow workshop as a substitute, which will give him an official version of the helmet. The main members will each be equipped with a low latency helmet that is worth around 20,000 credits. Doesn't he want to play with that? Seeing that he doesn't respond, Yi says that he probably just got scammed by that black-hearted boss of his. But he shouldn't feel bad, as he will help him rise to the top. Suddenly, Fung appears from behind him and notes that he is the one who founded that workshop he speaks so badly about. Do they have a problem here? Yi starts pushing his head with his finger and he notes that he cannot believe that this prestigious Jinhai University has people like him. Someone who cannot even afford a helmet wants to open a workshop. How dumb can he be? He must be dreaming, right? He should wake up though, as this isn't healthy for his brain. Fung has had about enough of this simpleton, so he grabs his finger and breaks it. Now he knows that this university has people like him, right? Yi starts wailing in pain on the ground, and that's when the delivery people arrive with what Fung ordered for Hei a God's Domain Illusion 2100 Pro helmet, and a matching nerve conduction acceleration suit. Fung also tells the delivery people to change the dorm network to an ultra-low latency private network, and Hei is extremely happy, as all of this stuff is extremely luxurious. Yi starts telling him off, as now he's just trying to put on a show in the dorm room. But what if he is rich, huh? He better watch out from now on, as he will tell the Shadow Workshop boss about him. He will make him not able to play the game anymore. Hei explains that Shadow is nothing compared to the mighty Ouroboros, and Feng has attracted the attention of Bai Qin Shui, the white snow from that guild. Yi is surprised when he hears that name, but doesn't show it, and says that it doesn't matter. Even if he brags with that information, 
He was not accepted into Ouroboros anyway, because he was a loser. That's why he decided to open his own workshop, right? What even is the name of this workshop? Fung explains that it is the wings that will lift them up from zero to the top. The Zero Wing Workshop. Does he want to join, perhaps? Yi goes back to Zhang Luowei, the second in command in the Shadow Workshop, and tells him that he is almost done recruiting everyone in his dorm apartment. Luowei asks what he means by almost, and Yi explains that everyone except for Hei has agreed to join, but he is like a dumb bull. He just doesn't want to move from his place no matter what. He also joined a workshop called the Zero Wing, which suddenly popped up in their school. He even said that he looks down on the trashy Shadow Workshop. Loai asks what Zero Wing he is talking about, and Yi goes into further detail. The boss of Zero Wing is the fourth-year university student, Shi Feng, who has become an arrogant bastard as of late. Loai asks how many people are in this workshop, and Yi tells him that there are only six members currently. Loai begins laughing as he hears this and asks Yi why he is taking them so seriously, when there are only six people in that puny workshop. He should better put his focus on this year's sorority meeting at school, as it is a great opportunity for Shadow to get even more members, so they shouldn't waste their time on a few kids playing around. Additionally, they must secure the achievement of being the first to clear a 20-man dungeon. When that time comes, they will receive tons of generous rewards. Yi agrees, but he is still worried about the Zero Wing Workshop, but Loai tells him to relax, as he will take care of it soon enough. In his past life, during college, Fung was almost entirely focused on gaming, so much in fact that he disregarded his studies completely. At the same time, while he was fooling around, his parents fell very ill due to their mental exhaustion, and their family had to pay tons of medical fees that were not easy to handle. Now that he has the chance to start everything over, he will not make the same mistakes again. He has promised himself at least that. That is why now he is transferring over 10,000 credits and telling them that he is earning this cash from a part-time job, while also reminding them to take precautions against falling ill. This should be enough to solve his family crisis. All he needs to deal with now is the problem of his studies. Later that day, he goes back to his classroom, and everyone there notes that it's quite rare for the little prince of truancy to show up to class, especially today of all days. Most people look at him with disdain, as he is the worst student in this class, and even seeing someone like him makes them mad. Fung forgot about how his fellow students treated him, but this only means that he was more of a failure in his past life than he anticipated. Not a single classmate liked him. However, there is one exception to that. Zhao Ruoxi, who always looked at him without any prejudice, even when the others would ostracize him relentlessly. She warns him that if something awful happens during the class meeting, he shouldn't do anything with Lin Failong. He hears this and asks what they shouldn't do, while also asking Feng why he even bothered to show up. Lin Fei Long, he is not a dumb bastard, as he certainly has a few tricks up his sleeve. After graduation, he managed to finesse the young lady of a huge organization into marrying him. After that, it only took him three years to become the chairman of that organization. However, due to the ever-growing influence of the virtual industry, he invested most of his funds into God's domain. It is truly a pity that he did not cooperate with Shadow at all, as he betrayed them and rose himself up to the most influential entity. On this day, he was sure that he couldn't come to the class meeting, so he decided to join hands with the other classmates in order to ruin him and prevent him from studying further. This was the turning point of his past life that caused everything to spiritual down into the abyss that he couldn't crawl out of. Fung says that he is here for the class meeting, since he is also part of the class. There shouldn't be anything wrong with that, right? Lin is angry that he is here, but still decides to go with the predetermined plan. He says that they should skip the class meeting stuff and get straight to the important stuff. Everyone in this class knows by now that he is obsessed with fighting competitions, but his grades are not ideal to say the least. Therefore, he would like someone to give him their bachelor's degree so he can graduate without any issues. They will put that to a vote, since he is so generous. Everyone congratulates him for being so democratic and kind. Lin says that he has a simple suggestion as to who to choose. That would be Fung naturally as he barely attends his classes anyways, so the degree shouldn't mean anything to a lousy bum like him. Everyone agrees, as Fung is truly worthless in their predatory eyes. He thinks that this is playing out exactly as it did in his past life, but this time he has shown up to hinder Lin's ploy and reforge his future with his own two hands. Ruoxi asks how they can decide something like that without Fung's input, but Lin tells her to shut up, as nobody asked for her damn opinion. Still. He asks Fung if he agrees, as this is the decision of the entire class, 
so he should also agree, right? Fung notes that he will not, which makes Lin turn aggressive. But Fung anticipated this and can only smile. With a simple move, he throws Lin into the wall, much to everyone's surprise, and tells him to get the hell out of his sight while he is still being merciful. Lin is fully passed out, however, and Fung dusts his hands off while saying that he may be the school-level fighting champion, but he only amounts to this, a weakling. Suddenly, someone from outside of the classroom screams that Lin got beaten up, and that person is Zhou Yuhu's girlfriend, a guy he beat up in the game previously. The girlfriend recognizes him but he shouldn't be back in school. Yuhu asks how he knows of him, and Feng notes he can't believe that his ex, Qin Shu Yu, managed to get herself a new boyfriend so fast. But considering her standards, he shouldn't be that surprised, no? Yuhu is boiling with rage, as he was already pissed because he lost his position due to that Ye Feng bastard, but now Shi Feng has shown up and is also causing trouble. Just what is with these Fungs all around the place? Yuhu walks towards Feng angrily and says that he has insulted him by beating up one of his underlings. So now he will have to teach him a very important lesson. When he gets right in front of him, he notes that he feels like they have met somewhere before. Ruoshi gets in front of Yuhu and tells him to stop, as this is their class and outsiders like him have no business calling the shots around here. Yuhu touches her face and asks if she's perhaps interested in this bum. But Feng removes his arm from her and explains that just fighting would be quite boring. How about they add some spice by betting? Yuhu agrees and says that he will bet a thousand credit points if he wins the money is his. But if he loses, he will have to pay him the same amount while also kneeling and licking his boots like the dog he is. Does that sound good? Feng feels that only a thousand is too stingy so he would like to add another zero to that amount. Shu Yu asks if he can really fork over that amount of cash considering his family circumstances. But Feng shows them that he has the money. So if he refuses, that means he's a coward. Yu Hu smiles as he sees the money, since winning against such a bum will be a piece of cake for someone like him. While they get ready to fight in the school ring, a sentence I never expected to say, the other students think that Feng has finally gone insane. Since Yu Hu is a municipal level fighting champion, he may have gotten lucky with Lin Fai Long, but now he is dead for sure. Shu Yu asks how strong he can be. Even if he learned any martial arts, he is just a dumbass who is trying to punch a rock with his bare hands. This isn't a game. This is the real world, where being weak is the heaviest sin anyone can bear. Yu Hu asks if he's regretting his tough act now that he is inside of the ring, but Feng ignores him and thinks that his consciousness is from 10 years in the future. After experiencing tons of extremely realistic life and death situations in God's domain, his combat technique and experience have improved far more than anyone could imagine. He should be leagues ahead of the fighters in the real world. However, the only problem that he may have is that his physical body has never gone under training, so he might not be able to exert the power he wishes to. It is similar to being restricted by level in video games. Even if he has great control of his skills, it's no use if he cannot do any damage. But games are far from the real world, as there are many parts of the human body that cannot be strengthened and are to be considered weaknesses, like the eyes, temples, or throat. All of these are defenseless against attacks. Even the family gems are game in this cruel world. So even if Feng lacks physical training, there are many ways for this match to go the way he wants it to go. Yu Hu sees him smirking like a dumbass and charges in with a heavy attack right off the bat. The moment he gets into hitting range, Feng sticks out his thumb and goes for his throat. Striking the larynx compresses the opponent's windpipe, causing instant obstruction in their breathing. In this state of suffocation, the opponent becomes a vulnerable and defenseless slab of meat. Yuhu takes a step back and wants to ask how he managed to do this, but Feng doesn't let him as he strikes his temple. Doing this makes the blood rush to the opponent's head, causing an instant loss of balance and most times, consciousness. Yuhu falls to the ground from the amount of incapacitating attacks, and the students are shocked to see him actually winning, as Yuhu is a fighting champion on the municipal level. Is Feng that strong? Feng thinks that the muscle nutrition potion, priced at 50,000 per bottle, can stimulate the muscles to grow rapidly, ensuring that even prolonged gaming sessions do not lead to muscle atrophy or worse. This was something that he could not afford in his past life, but now he can. Lin Fei Long and Qin Shu Yu Finally, he has paid them back tenfold for their grievances in this life and in the past. After Feng gets out of the ring, Ruoshi rushes to him and asks if he really is the Feng she used to know. That doesn't matter though, as ten days from now, there will be a social event organized by the school. High-ranking executives from tons of well-known companies will be there, 
so he should give it some thought and attend it if he can. Fung says that he will be there and goes back to his room. He thinks about the social event as an opportunity, a chance to enter an area he couldn't even look at in his previous life. In preparation for this event, he will have to earn some money in the game, so he puts his headset on and goes back to the world of God's domain. Due to the new headset, Fung can now control his character with even greater precision and execute commands that wouldn't have been possible before. He is dropped somewhere near where he logged off, and his mission to find the Titan's heart is still in motion. He runs up the sets of stairs that he was dropped on, which is very easy now that he can run faster, and eventually finds the Titan's heart, the thing that keeps the fortress alive with its energy. Suddenly, a jester appears above him and notes that he did not expect to see any visitors after so many years have passed. The jester welcomes Fung to Barutia, and to celebrate him being the first player to ever set foot here, he has decided to use his blood and flesh as an appetizer for his dear pet. That pet being a three-headed hellhound, an elite rank level 15 beast. Fung wonders if the changes he had in his fate also resulted in the game levels being modified, as he does not remember such a boss ever existing. But it doesn't matter, as he will do like he did with the others. Kill it. The hellhound attacks Fung with a fire breath attack. But Fung is long gone from that spot as he is above the beast, using the gravity ring. His plan is to use phantom kill to deal tons of damage to the beast, but it unfortunately notices and prepares to unleash another breath attack. He cannot hope to defend himself while in the air, so he just takes the attack, which reduces his stamina by 30%, and the frozen debuff was also applied on him. It doesn't stop there, however, as the hound summons a lightning attack above Feng which sends him flying to the ground and makes the jester laugh maniacally, as he can't believe he is still alive after this barrage. What a cockroach. Fung is the most surprised here, as the three heads cooperated with each other masterfully, and they even managed to cast high damage area of attack spells with different attributes. If he hadn't cast a defensive blade in time, he would have been turned into ashes by the lightning. The three-headed hellhound truly is a strong boss. The jester noticed that he kept himself alive using those pesky blades, so he will graciously get rid of them using a high-tier dispersal technique. Thus, he uses Dispel on Feng which destroys the blades and makes Feng think that he knows of this jester enemy. He is not particularly strong in combat, but he has some really disgusting skills tied to him. But he shouldn't be a problem right now, as he only needs to get the titan's heart and leave. Even if he tries to outrun the hellhound, it slaps him around like a pup due to its high-speed physical attacks and even the damage he gets is too great. The beast tries to hit him with some fireball while he is dazed, but Fung has enough time to get out of the way. Seeing that this human doesn't want to die, the jester tells his puppy to use Frost Nova, which lands perfectly on Fung and causes him to be frozen in place for three entire seconds. Even if it's little time, it should be enough for the beast to hit him with an attack, which he will certainly die from. That's when Fung remembers the attribute resistance scrolls he got from the chest. There is still hope for him, However, he can activate only one scroll at a time, so he has a 1 in 3 chance of successfully defending himself. The jester is surprised that he has one of those items, but still, if he chooses the wrong one, he will still suffer a bad death. The hellhound decides to use a fire breath attack on him, and lucky for Fung, he has chosen the right scroll. The jester is angry that he got so lucky, but Fung notes that he will soon find out if he's lucky or not. The hellhound attacks with a physical attack next which Fung expected, so he uses the gravity ring once again and goes straight for the jester, who is puzzled as to why he's doing this. But Fung says that it has something to do with his precious little pet down below. Since he loves his little puppy so much that he wants to feed it daily, why doesn't he have a taste of its moveset? Feng uses another fire resistance scroll on him and stands right next to the jester, while the hellhound unleashes a mighty breath attack in their direction, slaying the jester without any way for him to defend himself. Fung thinks that the Hellhound changes attack attributes in a circular fashion, meaning that he always does fire, ice lighting, and lastly physical. As long as one remembers the type of damage the next move will have, the attacks will become quite easy to handle. Seeing that its master has been defeated, the Hellhound has no will to fight anymore, so it just sits around and watches Fung while wagging its tail left and right. Fung is pleasantly surprised by this, and now that nobody is there to stop him, he grabs the Titan Heart, which becomes tiny in his hand. This completes the quest he had, which gives him one black iron badge, one blackbeard recommendation letter, one advanced magical ability, 100,000 XP, and he is now worshipped in the Hammerstone town. He thinks that even though the equipment he got is very nice, due to the level restrictions they are useless to him, 
it is better for him to feed these to the Abyssal Blade in order to raise its power even further. He does just that, and eventually raises the Abyssal Blade's level by one. This has boosted the sword to even greater power, and he can now swing it with even greater force than before. Eventually, he goes back to the town and thinks that together with an invite to the Ouroboros Guild first raid on the Dark Moon Graveyard, White Snow gave him two extra spots to take in any allies he wanted. Thus, he chose the Cursemancer Hay and the Shield Warrior Kola, as they are a ranged mage and a tank respectively, so they should cover for his weak points quite nicely in the raid. Fung gives them a bunch of high-quality items that have amazing stats. But it's to be expected as this is Zero Wing's first battle, there is no way that he would let them go unprepared. He also sent them more equipment through the email. They should get ready so that they can get a move on already. Tons of guilds are gathered at the raid spot. The 5th place Guild Martial Union, the 4th place Heaven's Crown, the 3rd place The Assassin Alliance, the 2nd place Shadow Guild, and 1st place Ouroboros. Everyone is amazed that so many guild leaders are gathered in one single spot. But why are they not starting the mission? Are they perhaps waiting for someone else? Zhou asks Xiao if they have arrived yet, which she denies, as Feng is probably too scared of getting embarrassed, so he's taking his time. When she says that though a summon appears behind her, and out of it pop out Feng Hei and Kola, all geared up and ready to take on the raid. Lo Ai looks at the newcomers and Yi comes closer to tell him that this is the guy who did bad to their comrades previously. They absolutely cannot allow this disrespect, they need to teach him a lesson since he also dissed the boss. Loe calms him down, as if they attack him here their reputation will be damaged. The current task they got, to clear the Dark Moon Graveyard comes as a priority. As for Feng, he will certainly find a way to deal with him easily. Feng looks at the Shadow Forces and thinks that in his past life he would have been part of that group too. But now he is going to build a much better competitor, since he is the founder of Zero Wing. Since everyone is here, White Snow explains that the Ouroboros Guild will be the leader of this group mission, with her being the commander. Additionally, the loot will be randomly distributed by the system according to everyone's needs. Feng says that what she said now isn't what they agreed on. They should be given priority in regards to the blueprints that will drop. Or have they already forgotten how generous he was? Xiao explains that it's because they all thought highly of him when they first met. But now that their gear has been upgraded, they are going to be fine without him at the Dark Moon Graveyard. Another player says that he should feel grateful they even let his little group of vagabonds join in and White Snow apologizes, but she has to put the interest of the guild first and foremost. Hey wonders how such a major guild can go back on their words so easily, but Feng says that it's fine, as they will let their luck play out. He thinks that White Snow most likely wants more bargaining chips to have an equal negotiation with the Ouroboros guild. Her reputation precedes her. She really isn't an easygoing person at all. She starts hyping everyone up for the missions, as they need to bring out the best results in order to get the first clear of this dungeon. By the way, I don't know if the author just forgot, but Fung should have been drawn here as Fung, not as Black Flame. Just a reminder in case someone was confused. They get inside of the dungeon and walk for a while, which spooks Kola, as he doesn't see any sort of end to this constant fog in front of them. Feng tells him to relax, as they are almost at the exit anyway. Xiao comes next to him and notes that now he had first-hand experience with White Snow's leadership. Truly, it's something he can't ever achieve, right? Feng thinks that it is true that she's a good leader. Everything she does, she does with a clear head. Planning, allocation, and coordination, they are all impeccable. Additionally, it is thanks to her commands that the entire team was able to retreat from powerful monsters, like the kobolds they met earlier. But it's strange as there hasn't been a single injury or death in the team. Was this graveyard dungeon really always this easy? Suddenly a few screams can be heard from the front, and White Snow wants answers, but there is nobody to answer as the system announces that two party members have been killed. White Snow thinks that it must be a dangerous enemy, as those who died were part of the Ouroboros main forces. She does not waver, however, and instantly gets control of the situation. She tells the healers to stand guard while the supports guard the healers. The tanks should activate their defensive skills, and everyone else should get ready for battle. Fung then tells everyone that something is coming this way, out of the fog, and already seems to have caught a player by surprise. Seeing it, Fung immediately tells everyone to activate their defensive skills, if they don't want to die. Kola instantly listens to Fung's orders, and activates his protection skill, but the player who was caught off guard is too stunned to do anything at this point. So with one dark attack through the head, 
the beast kills him and also tries to hurt Kola, who fortunately has his defenses up. This monster is called a Graveyard Guardian, which is a special elite and has 5,000 GP, which regenerates while it's in the mist, a truly vicious creature. White Snow orders everyone to retreat but not enter the mist, while Fung orders Kola to not retreat just yet, as he should cover him and the healing team. Kola trusts his words fully, which shocks Joe. How can he listen to Fung's orders? Are they perhaps implying that White Snow is an unreliable leader? With his HP, that tank will be dead if he takes another attack. White Snow orders the healers to replenish Kola's HP, and they do it as quickly as they can, just in time for the beast to unleash a mighty attack on him that creates a large explosion. Fortunately, Kola was strong enough to block this attack, giving Fung ample opportunity to jump in the air and cut one of the beast's hands off. He thinks that he won't be able to cast any other spells for a while after this, and Hei uses Evil Whip to tie the graveyard down which starts regenerating its hand since it is technically still in the mist. White Snow spots this and tells Zout to get on it, so she unleashes a mighty flame attack on the beast, which she thinks was easy to defeat. But Fung tells her that the mist has yet to disappear, so she shouldn't let her guard down even for a second. That's when even more guardians appear out of it. And what's more is that zombies also start appearing, which are not that dangerous by their stats, but they can revive after being killed. These zombies take most players by surprise, and they die one after another. While Joe and Xiao give constant advice to White Snow, who thinks that if their team were to get wiped out, tons of people would lose levels that they have worked hard to get, but their reputation will crumble if they are to retreat from this battle. Fung tells her to not retreat, as he has come up with a way to get out of this situation, but command must be handed over to him, if she wants everyone else to live. Joe tells her that she cannot hand over command to that bastard, no matter what, but she chooses to ignore her and gives him command instantly. Xiao does not want to listen to someone like him, but Fung tells them to shut up already. If they do not want to die here, they should follow his orders down to the last minute detail. He explains that the guardians and zombies are blocking their path, but they are not part of the mobs that they must kill to clear the Dark Moon graveyard. Since these things will keep spawning without end, they cannot get caught up with fighting them, as they will only deplete their resources. He orders Zhou to pick her biggest fire area of attack spell and target an empty space with it, which will create a large area where there will be no mist, which will allow the team to pass quicker. Everyone else should prepare to move, as they will be left behind if they waver now. White Snow watches as he gives out orders and thinks only those who have experience in gaming tactics would know about such a straightforward strategy. She suspected it before, but is he really a beta tester? Joe tells him to not be so arrogant as he is still relying on her perfect magic in order to do anything. But to confirm that, she will show him her secret ultimate skill, Flame Tempest. She does just that which takes out any zombie that was in the mist she targeted, and creates a pretty sizable walkway through the mist. Everyone gets to running as fast as they possibly can, with the zombies still following them, but Fung tells them to not look back, as that will only slow them down. Three hours after the Dark Moon graveyard opened, there was still no signs of any guild clearing the dungeon. Even the Assassin's Alliance has been defeated, as Heartstabber respawns at the entrance and says that he cannot believe his team didn't even make it past the first scenario. Truly, this game is just insane when it comes to difficulty. He continues to follow the team the best he can, but he unfortunately falls down due to fatigue and can only scream that he does not want to die. That's when the zombies and the mists stop with Fung explaining that mobs don't leave their designated zones, so they have escaped their aggro range. Hei takes his hand and says that this game was not designed for humans, but Fung tells him this is just the beginning. The real fight is about to come, since they have arrived. A large ominous door stands before them, and Joe thinks that this must be the tomb they have to go in, but they already lost so many players without even seeing it. Fung asks if she's getting scared, but White Snow tells him to not look down on their guild. They only managed to get to this place because their comrades sacrificed themselves. Now they need to press onwards, for their sakes, if for nothing else. Fung agrees and slowly opens the door to the tomb. They all walk in while looking around, but eventually they arrive at their main target, who ominously stands in the middle. This is Patch Leo, the Fallen Lord, a Lord Rank monster with a gigantic pool of 120,000 GP. White Snow thinks that this thing must be the boss, and Fung confirms it. They can walk around the Graveyard Guardians, but they cannot go without defeating the final boss, which is this guy right here. 
This is a fundamental rule of God's domain. He knows of only two ways to leave the Dark Moon graveyard. Either they kill him, or they die. White Snow says that she knows about him having special information regarding lots of things. So what are their odds of winning against this boss? Feng stands silent for a second and then announces that his information seems to be off slightly. Feng thinks that Patch Leo shouldn't have appeared during this stage. Either things have deviated from his memories, or the current team he's a part of is making even greater progress in the game than anyone did in his previous life. Meaning that he is experiencing things like this before they were patched for fairness. Joe says that it's over for them, as even Fung, who is full of ideas, seems stumped. If they have to die, she would rather just die on her own terms than be killed by a monster. That's just too painful to experience more than once. Fung then notes that they should try crossfire tactics. But even with that, they will only have a 20% chance of winning this thing. Joe is not that impressed, as if it's only 20%, it's no different than jumping in blindly. White Snow says that it's very likely for their entire party to get wiped out anyways, so they might as well bet on that 20%, but she would like an explanation of this tactic first. Fung explains that the crossfire tactic is mostly used against bosses. First, they will have all players who are melee attack the boss at once. After they get the aggro of the boss, the melee players will instantly run away, while the ranged players will start dealing easy damage to the boss. Once the ranged players dealt enough damage to the boss, it will switch its aggro on them, so the melee players will pull the aggro once again. They will repeat this until the boss dies, but it's important to remember that in this tactic, it's preferable to keep the boss as far away from the ranged players as possible. White Snow says that he makes it sound quite easy, but it just doesn't seem practical no matter how they swing it. The ranged players will be able to keep their distance, sure, but how are the melee players supposed to keep themselves from being hit by the boss? Fung tells her that it's impossible to not get hit. That is true, and the only remaining melee players in this team are her cola and him. That means that they must be prepared to sacrifice themselves, no matter what. Joe immediately gets on his case, as he can do to himself what he wants, but he cannot treat his own teammates as fodder to be used. That's just not fair. Cola says that he will do as he wishes. As long as he gives the command, he will climb a mountain or jump in a well without an ounce of hesitation. White Snow explains that as squad leader, she can sacrifice herself in order for Ouroboros to become the first guild to ever clear the Dark Moon graveyard. So only this time, she will allow him to treat her life as he wishes. Fung looks at her and thinks that she sure has a prickly attitude, but she is extremely responsible when it comes to her own guild. It would not be an exaggeration to say that she has become a spiritual pillar for everyone. She tells everyone to get ready for combat, as even if they fail, at least they will die honorably. She is the first one to charge in, which the boss notices, and Fung tells her to prepare for the boss's first strike. It seems that the attack has hit her, but that was only an illusion, as she is right next to him and hits him in the head with a powerful attack. This gets the boss's attention, and she orders the ranged players to do their thing now. Hei uses Hellfire on him, which engulfs the boss in flames, but Joe tells him to move, as that will only tickle him and unleashes a powerful flame attack. Hei thinks that should be enough. But Joe tells him to not be so relaxed, as that beast has 120,000 hit points. This is not over. Sure enough, the boss charges in, but this time Fung is the one who attacks him with a debuff attack, which removes half of his speed, hopefully giving the casters enough time to dodge. Unfortunately, the caster cannot discern what the boss is doing, so he slams the ground and catches both of the casters by surprise. Next, he prepares to strike Joe with a heavy attack, but she and Hei cannot move as the boss has immobilized them with his debuff. Instead of attacking like a normal boss, Patch Leo chooses to just throw the sword at Joe, who says that she doesn't want to die. Seeing that there's nothing else to do, Fung uses the gravity ring to get in front of her and uses defensive blade to deflect the sword with all of his might. He succeeds, but this attack has taken more out of him than he would have liked to, so he falls to the ground. Everyone goes to his side and White Snow looks from the distance. She did not expect for the first person to fall to be Fung, who is now slowly dematerializing as his HP reaches zero. Suddenly, Xiao grabs his hand and begins casting a long spell on Fung, which fully heals him. He is naturally quite surprised by this, and she explains that it's a recovery spell she learned recently, so she used it because he cannot die here. It is a spell that can be used one every day, and it's called Saved by the Heavens. Fung rises up and thanks her for the sacrifice, but the boss has had enough of their talking and picks up its sword. Fung warns everyone about this, 
and Cola tries to taunt him with one of his skills, but the taunt does nothing. White Snow pops up from behind him and unleashes a flurry of attacks on his back, but the attacks do nothing to change the boss's aggro, as it's only looking at Fung. The system warns him that Patch Leo has locked on him, so until he dies, his aggro will not be transferred to anyone else no matter what. Fung notices that they have brought his HP down to less than half, so this constant aggro means that the boss is now entering the second phase. Fung uses Phantom Kill to create a few clones and tells everyone to attack the boss with everything they got as they don't have to worry about the aggro anymore. In this second phase, Leo will continue hunting the most high value target in the area until they are eliminated. So the boss will only attack him for now, which is a perfect opportunity for everyone. Fung moves very fast which confuses the boss and allows the casters to give it their all as they unleash mighty spells. The boss can only lock onto one person at once, but now it's being disrupted by four identical targets, so the AI will pick the closest clone that he can find and attack that, since it looks identical to its main target. As long as Fung keeps adjusting his clones to keep their distance from him, the boss will be stuck in place, and the others will be able to attack him without any danger. Suddenly, the boss lets out a primal roar and instantly removes the clones. Patch Leo has just entered his final phase. Fung warns everyone that in this final phase, his reaction speed and aggressiveness will skyrocket and he also gains an ability, Death Acquisition. This ability will allow him to recover 10% of his HP every time he kills a player, so if any of them die right now, their efforts would have all been for nothing. White Snow understands, and Fung orders his party to stop attacking, not use any sorts of heals, and they should avoid drawing aggro at all costs. White Snow also warns her party to retreat beyond the boss's attack range, as they will take care of it. Joe tells the last remaining Ouroboros members to retreat, and so only Fung and White Snow are left to fight the boss. Fung begins fighting him, but he already knows all of his attack patterns, so he dodges and uses Thundering Slash afterwards. After he is done, White Snow comes from behind and jumps right on his neck. Before she can remove her sword, Leo manages to grab her tightly, and as a result throws her to the ground. It seems that everything is lost as Leo raises his foot to crush White Snow, but Fung uses the ring's power to send White Snow flying before she is hit. Seeing that she is in a weaker state, Fung tells her to get as far away as possible, as he will be the one to deal the final blow to this thing. White Snow reluctantly stays behind, and Fung enchants his sword with fire while charging in. Leo suddenly speaks and tells them that challenging him like this is like self-destruction, they have not a single chance against him. Fung uses the demonic sword skill, Flame Blade Dance, but Leo suddenly uses a barrier on himself, which Fung simply cannot go through, so the enchantment he puts on is wasted. Seeing that it has come to this, Fung chooses to rely only on his sword skills now, and he uses the Nine Dragons ability to deal tons of damage to Leo, who only has 808 HP left. Leo roars once again, and sends Fung back as a result, but like a fool, White Snow charges in and says that the final blow has to be dealt by them, the Ouroboros Guild. Fung tells her to stop right now, but she is too thick-headed to even hear him, so she still charges in. Unfortunately for her, even her mightiest attack has no effect on Leo, as her weapon simply breaks on his armor. She can't even comprehend what just happened, but Leo raises his sword into the air and notes that her life is his from now on. He lets his sword fall on her and Fung rushes in, thinking that no matter what he can't let this stupid woman die here. Fung tries his best to make it in time, but suddenly the world pauses, and in real life, his gear begins overloading, something which he can feel. The system warns him about countless malfunctions, and the synchronization rate between him and his character becomes even larger. This continues to happen until his character's consciousness and his own become one and the same. But this gives him even greater power, as the overclocking mode has just been activated. Within an instant, Fung gets to Leo and blocks his sword, which shocks both him and White Snow, who cannot believe the amount of power he showed now. Leo asks how he managed to gain such speed, and Fung notes that even if he were to explain it, he just wouldn't get it. He uses his abyssal bind to keep Leo in place and attacks him with deadly force, making Leo fall to the ground. His party members just sit idly by and wonder when this guy is going to stop growing. Fung looks at his hand and thinks that overclocking mode causes damage to the player in the real world, so it was banned by game developers long ago. He just accidentally activated it because he was using the latest gear possible. Leo is on his knees, utterly defeated, and asks Fung what kind of price he had to pay to gain such power. Even if he won't understand, Fung explains that his physical body will receive the same damage as his avatar, 
So should this in-game character die, the player in the real world will become fully brain dead. However for him, who has been humiliated time and time again by people who are trash, this price is worth paying. He cuts Leo's head off, and the system rewards him with the chest of the ancient Holy Emperor for being the first player to defeat him. Outside of the dungeon, everyone gets the news that Ouroboros and Zero Wing are the first workshops who managed to clear the dungeon. The players around the dungeon can believe that Ouroboros managed to clear the dungeon, but just what is the Zero Wing workshop? Nobody really knows of them now, but they must be quite big if they are able to appear on the ranking board like this. Seeing this, Loai becomes impatient and asks Yuhu about their guild's progression on the dungeon. He explains that they are stuck at the first stage. Their main team died so many times that they all dropped tons of levels. Emergency reinforcements are en route as they speak, but even those might not be able to do anything. Loai has heard enough so he pushes him away and calls them a bunch of worthless trash who don't deserve anything. Fung's level rises to 7, and the people around him cannot believe that they actually managed to defeat the boss, so his team members celebrate as they will go down in history. Joe rushes to White Snow and is also very glad that they managed to clear the dungeon, but White Snow is more amazed by Fung as his abilities are truly terrifying. He asks who gets to open the chests and White Snow allows him to since he is the one that killed the boss. He does just that and tons of rare and precious loot drops, enough for everyone to make a fortune out of. Items like the Rune Sword and Rune Shield, who are mysterious iron rank and very good for anyone to use. White Snow orders his guild to roll for equipment they need, as the people with the highest rolls will get the item. Some think of selling the items they get, and others think of keeping them, but White Snow offers Fung the privilege to take any item he wants as he deserves it. Fung looks around for a bit and spots a blade called the Blade of Ashes. That is what he wants. Joe thinks that he is dumb, as items that emit that red glow are cursed, so considered trash. Nobody will dare to touch it even if it dropped. So why doesn't he just get any other items from the countless ones they have here? White Snow also offers Fung all of the high-level blueprints materials and equipment pieces. She is doing this because she wants to get Fung into their guild, but first they need to strengthen their bond. Fung asks her why the generosity, and she explains that her offer still stands. She hopes that he can leave Zero Wing and join Ouroboros. Fung accepts the kind gesture, which makes White Snow think that he is finally willing to join the guild. If he does, their guild will truly be the strongest in God's domain. Unfortunately for her, Fung just refuses, which angers Zhou as he just took advantage of them. Fung notes that he rejected them because he already has comrades that he cannot let down no matter what. White Snow asks if she also lets his friends join, and Fung asks them how they would feel about it. Hei feels conflicted as he would be very happy to join Ouroboros since they are one of the top guilds, but he is Fung's follower and friend. He will stand by him and grow together with Zero Wing. Someday their workshop will become top tier, so he has no desire to join them. Cola feels the same, and White Snow gives up, but she hopes to work again with them in the future. The exit portal opens behind them and Fung says that it's about time they get out of this dark place. When they do get out, Everyone in the server is informed that Ouroboros and the Zero Wing Guild are the first guilds to clear the Dark Moon Graveyard Dungeon on Hell Difficulty. They each will receive 30 reputation with Red Leaf Town, 50,000 XP, a treasure chest, and 10 prestige. When Fung walks outside, the Martial Guild leader waits for him, geared up and presumably ready to fight. Ironsword did not expect them to clear the Dark Moon Graveyard. Their Martial Union did not gain anything, despite the resources they spent on it. White Snow gets out of the portal behind Fung and says that they are a guild that specializes mostly in PvP. So the reason for failing to clear the dungeon, they must find it within themselves. Ironsword slowly pulls out his sword and notes that if they already know that they are specialized in PvP, they should know how they get equipment, isn't that right? White Snow analyzes them and despite most of them looking quite weak, they are still large in number. So it would be troublesome to deal with this now. Ironsword says that even so, he will show his benevolence and take only half of the loot he gained from the Dark Moon Graveyard. That is much better than being beaten and losing everything, or so he thinks. Drifting Blood comes around and notes that they are all exhausted now. They must be from the dungeon. Can't they just rush them and get the equipment? Ironsword agrees. They can do that quite easily. But that is their second priority, as the first priority comes to Fung. Today he will leave him with nothing to his name. He will make sure he walks out of this place in his god-given suit. Seeing that this brute will most likely not see to reason, Fung tells White Snow to take everyone and go to the woods behind this place. 
There are too many of them at the moment, and since they specialize in PvP, it would be hard to deal with everyone if they were surrounded. Ironsword has heard his plan and says that he will not let him run away, no matter what it takes. Fung steps forward and asks, Does he really want his equipment? Then he should come and get it, if he can, that is. Ironsword becomes enraged after seeing him being arrogant even in this situation, but now they are not in town, so there will be no guards that help him. He tells everyone there to get ready for battle, which makes Hei fired up, as he has been dying for a chance to test out his new equipment. Zhou wonders if Feng really plans to fight a PvP guild like this, and White Snow says that she cannot have this much disrespect aimed at their guild. He will have to pay a heavy price for such things. Ironsword charges in and tells them to get out of here, as he has no need to fight Ouroboros right now. But if they still choose to help, they will take them down along with this bum. He tries to hit Fung with a rather open and slow yet powerful attack, which Fung easily dodges and kicks him away. Ironsword wonders when this bastard became so fast and Fung tells everyone to go into the woods now. He will deal with this himself. While Hei does just that, White Snow seems to be having another idea, as she goes into the opposite direction with sword in hand. One of the mage players of the Martial Guild attempts to suddenly attack Xiao, who was caught off guard, but Lonely jumps in and uses unyielding shield to protect her. When the attack hits, Lonely's HP falls by only a quarter, and so he starts flexing to Xiao about his tanking. She starts healing him as thanks, and the mage from the Martial Union wonders why his magic defense rose so suddenly. Not wanting to be left out of the fun, Zhao prepares a mighty fire blast and unleashes it on the players behind Ironsword, giving them tons of damage. Even if he is surprised by the amount of power she exerted, he tells his group to charge in faster, as even if they have a powerful mage, they can overturn them with their numbers. Zhao notices that they are even more adamant in charging in now, so she asks how they dare to fight Ouroboros while preparing another mighty spell. The Blazing Dragon Roar, which hits the main tank of the group fully, and it kills him on impact. This shocks Ironsword, as their main tank had tons of good items on him. Just how high is this woman's attack power? Seeing that she will not stop unleashing spells on his men, Ironsword orders his assassins to go around and kill that mage, no matter what. He turns his attention to where Fung was, but he has disappeared as Drifting Blood tells him so. Ironsword becomes increasingly madder, and orders Drifting Blood to rush and find him, as he will not allow that bastard to escape. Zhao continues to hit spell after spell on the charging enemies, and is too focused on them to notice the two assassins who are very happy to kill the renowned Flaming Moon. They will surely become famous. Due to their whispering, Zhao hears them, and prepares a flame burst in order to kill them both. But due to her spamming, her skills are now on cooldown, which should allow both of the assassins to easily take care of her. However, they only notice after the fact that their HP bars are suddenly fully empty, because Feng slashed both of them at blinding speeds. Zhao rushes to his side, but he can hear her words of thanks later, so he rushes to another spot once again, showing her that he is truly strong. The Martial Union healers continue to cast healing spells on their dying teammates, but soon enough Feng makes his appearance and takes out a cleric. Before the others can even notice, he takes them out too, which Ironsword notices so he uses a wild bull charge to close the distance between them and attempt to kill this bastard once and for all. The attack hits Fung's clone, the real one was standing behind Ironsword this entire time. Seeing that he only likes to play petty tricks, Ironsword dares him to take this next attack head on, as he will surely perish under his might. Fung does just that, but instead of perishing, he blocks his attack with ease and even mocks him, as his attack power doesn't seem to be that much. He kicks him away with great force, and while he is stunned, Fung appears from behind and strikes him with all kinds of slashes, leaving his HP to zero. He falls to the ground and before he respawns, Ironsword promises revenge once again. He will not let this slide. With their boss dead, the Martial Union players wonder if they should keep fighting, but Drifting Blood starts bossing them around, as he doesn't want to follow in his steps, so they should run away, while they still can. While they do that, he screams at Fung that this is not the end. The Assassin Alliance, who has been looking at this fight the whole time, say that they won't need their help this time. Heartstabber says that since they decided to provoke Fung like this, it was over. After they settle everything, Zero Wing leaves and Joe tells White Snow that it would be amazing to have such a pro like him in their guild. White Snow says that he is too amazing for that. A person like him will become their guild's opponent sooner or later, but really, she hopes that it comes later. 
The news about the Marshall Union being destroyed quickly spread throughout Red Leaf Town, and some people even uploaded videos of the fight on the official forum, which was instantly a hit, as it received thousands of views and likes. This was all credited to the Ouroboros Guild, however, as they are also known to be the first one to clear the hell-level Dark Moon Graveyard, and immediately after that they also off the Marshall Union. White Snow's image as a goddess grew even more, and so the status and influence the Ouroboros Guild has in White River City has skyrocketed with countless new players wanting to join them at all times. Even if Feng was not the main focus of the video, bigger guilds also began to notice Feng's existence on the server. Some players looked at him with fear, as he is the lunatic who has slain so many, while others look at him with a different kind of emotion, as it seems he has attracted some superfans of his own. Cola and Sloth come around too. To clarify, this red-haired one is called Cola, with the yellow-haired one being called Lonely. The author has had them mixed up for some time now. I have no clue why. I apologize, but I hope this clears some confusion. Cola grabs Lonely and notes that it must have been hard to tank in his place, but he won't need to do that. As the real Cola has arrived, and with the new skills that he has learned recently, he will be the one to take the front lines. Seeing that they are here, Feng gives both of them new items and tells them to get the rest of their gear repaired, and also get supplies for their next leveling run, as he is going to take care of something important first. Lonely and Hay also join them in their trip to the blacksmith, where they find out that to repair all of Hay's equipment, it will cost one silver and sixty-three copper, which seems to be a lot, until Lonely says that his cost four silver. The blacksmith explains that the greater the durability loss on the items, and the higher grade the equipment is, the higher the repair fee will cost. All other things are also equal. Plate armor is more expensive than leather, that is only natural. With a sad expression, Lonely hands him the money while noting that if he had not gained three silver and five bottles of recovery from the Dark Moon graveyard, his wallet would have been entirely empty now. What a game. Hay then remembers that since they have an improved reputation, they should have a 10% discount to things like this. So wouldn't the price be lower? The blacksmith becomes angry with him and says that the repair fee already has the 10% discount placed on it. So he better pay up and shut up. Feng, who is somewhere else, checks his inventory and sees that counting the blueprints for the shimmering chestplate he sold earlier, he now has a total of 73 gold. He also got the Blade of Ashes, which is a very good item, as its holder was once a mighty godslayer, and he had never seen this thing with his own eyes in his previous life. However, he remembers that he can learn more about this item only after reaching the Star Moon Kingdom, so until then this item is useless to him. Holding it in the storage is the wise choice for now. He also checks out the item Ironsword dropped when he was killed, which is unknown to him, so he uses a praise, which shows him that this is the Crystal of Seven Sparkles, a special item that can be used to teleport to the Blackwing City. Fung thinks that this must be the reason the Marshall Union rose up in power so quickly in his past life. This thing carried them hard. This item teleports the user and his party to a legendary area called the Blackwing City. Now that this treasure is in his hands, Ironsword will not rise to power ever again, and he will remain a two-bit guild leader forever. Today is also Black Friday, which is a big day in the Black Wing City, so he has to go there to profit off of it. He calls Hay and tells him to take the rest of the group and go to Roaring Hills, the level 8 area. There they will grind levels quite quickly. He will not be joining them, as he has something important to take care of. At the Black Wing City, in a random street alleyway, Fung appears out of a portal and thinks that this place is where the most famous auction in the entire game is. It is still early so he can take a look around the place before the auction takes place. Not wanting to be recognized, Fung uses his demon mask to disguise himself into black flame as he wants to visit the engineering shop first. Fung eventually finds a workshop and walks inside with confidence. But only two minutes later he walks out. As the items in there are too expensive, he can't afford anything good in there, especially the rocket boots he wanted. Those cost 1200 gold. They are perfect for making escapes as it's an epic rank equipment that was crafted by a master engineer, making it much better than ordinary rocket boots. Even so, he did manage to buy an intermediate frost grenade, as this should deal with anyone who would like to pursue him, like the Marshall Guild. The frost grenade freezes a target for 5 seconds, decreases their speed by 60% for 12 seconds, and also deals 800 damage. When he walks away, Fung bumps into a player, who at first thinks that he is just a dumb NPC who likes to do that, but notices that he has a level and a hidden name. So he is just another player who belongs to no guild. This guy is the egoistic Frenzied Blade, an Ouroboros player and a player from another country. 
Even though there is only one way to travel in Redleaf Town, the entire White River City has jurisdiction over hundreds of towns. There are hundreds of cities in the Star Moon Kingdom, and there are hundreds of countries in the whole of God's domain. As a neutral city-state, it is normal for Blackwing City to have hundreds of different players appear at any time. Frenzied notes that he is quite lucky to be in this place, considering that he is a player with no guild. But Fung chooses to ignore him, which makes Frenzied mad as he has to pay a price for bumping into someone as great as him like that. Fung asks what he wants, which makes him even madder. But another player stops Frenzied and says that everyone around this place is an elite from their respective country. So instead of fighting each other for no reason, would it not be better to make friends and exchange information? Frenzied says that he will let this matter go, on account of Lone Swan, the player that stopped him. Swan reaches for a handshake with Fung and introduces himself. He is from the Palace of Moon Reverence. Fung knows this name, as the Palace of Moon Reverence is an extremely famous guild in God's domain. They are affiliated with the Tulip Empire, and it is said that the competition among the various forces in that place is harsh, with the Palace of Moon Reverence being the leader amongst all of them. Fung introduces himself as Black Flame, from the Star Moon Kingdom. Swan notes that the Star Moon Kingdom is a long way from here, so this must be his first time coming to the Black Wing City. Is he after the auction house, perhaps? Black Flames confirms that he is, which makes Swan ask if he knows that he needs to buy a Black Wing emblem for two gold in order to enter the auction venue. Black Flame notes that he didn't know that, while thinking that it's better to say he doesn't even though he does, as this will help keep a low profile. Seeing that they are going to the same place, Swan invites him to their team, as he happens to have an extra Black Wing emblem on him, so he can bring him to the venue, free of charge. Frenzied immediately gets on his case, as a casual player like this guy doesn't deserve the right to get an emblem for free, that is not how the world works. He turns around to Swan and says that if he lets this noob join their team, he shouldn't blame him for quitting it and finding other players to join. Swan tries to reason with him, as even though Black Flame might be a casual player, he still managed to come to this place, which shows that he is at least capable. They might even encounter him more in the future. Frenzy does not see it that way, as he has the mighty bloodthirsty war god behind him. That's what capable is. An ordinary dude like this guy wants to have the same status as the best from the major guilds? How arrogant! Black Flame notices that their argument won't end anytime soon, so he refuses the offer and walks away, making Swan wonder if he is perhaps rich, as he won't be able to buy an emblem even for three gold coins, as they are all sold out. While he walks away, Frenzied tells him to not put on airs like that, as he is only a fool who will not be able to go through the auction doors without being kicked out by the guards. Eventually, the time for the auction arrives, but the guards refuse them entry, which makes Swan ask why, as they have the emblems, so what is the reason for entry refusal? The guard explains that ordinary people with emblems must wait for the VIPs to enter first, like that man, the Lord Demon Hunter, the VIP of the Black Wing City. He can enter without an emblem. When they look to see who they are talking about, they spot Black Flame, and the guards bow down to him as he enters, welcoming him as the Lord Demon Hunter, something which piques Swan's interest. When everyone is settled in their seats and everything is in order, the auction begins with a level 20 secret silver rank chest plate. The starting price for this epic item is only 2 gold. Fung uses the Observing Eyes skill to assess the breastplate. This is a skill to see concealed targets like the ones from the auction, and also allows VIP users to get further information on items. Fung acquired this skill while looking for treasures at a normal auction house. One of the players there notes that the breastplate hasn't been appraised, so it's really a gamble if it's of good quality or not. Seeing that everyone is hesitant to bet, he will liven the atmosphere up and even fish while he is at it. In character, he puts three gold on the item, which comes to everyone's surprise. As the famous demon hunter has taken an action, is this item perhaps a hidden treasure? Believing his title of demon hunter to be a show of his skill and knowledge, everyone believes that this item is truly a treasure. Frenzied laughs at Black Flame's low price and puts five gold on the item, which makes some players think that he must be really rich to put this much gold on an item. But some know already that he is an elite member of the Bloodthirsty War God Guild, one of the major guilds. He laughs as he receives these indirect compliments, but his three seconds of fame run out as Black Flame puts ten gold on the item. This makes the auction house blow up with talk, as the demon hunter just doubled the bid, with some players wondering if he can really beat someone from the Bloodthirsty War God in terms of cash. Not wanting to let this bastard have what he wants, Frenzied puts fifteen gold on the item 
which Black Flame increases to 20 gold instantly. Frenzied is mad once again at him outbidding him, but Swan tells him to take it slow, as 20 gold for only a chest plate. There is no need to go further. Frenzied pushes him away and says that he will not stop. Since this bum insists on showing only disrespect, he will put him in his place once and for all. He puts 30 entire gold on the item, while thinking that he will add all of the gold from the guild that he can to his bid. Everyone is surprised by this turn of events, as 30 gold is the entire budget of some minor guilds, yet he put all of that on a single chest plate? Some think that this just goes to show what a treasure this item is, as he wouldn't just bet all of that without knowing. Frenzied thinks that he has won the bid as he is only a bum without a guild, yet he is backed by the Bloodthirsty War God Guild. He has tons of cash. How is he going to compete with him now? Unfortunately for him, Black Flame puts 35 gold on the item, which Frenzied thinks of as impossible. How can a free player have so much gold? He asks the auction employee to check Black Flame's account, but he explains that the bid is valid. Black Flame looks at Frenzied and says that he thought he had the backing of the mighty Bloodthirsty War God Guild. What happened? He should show him his real strength, if he likes to boast so much. Frenzied becomes extremely furious, as he cannot stand all of this disrespect, so he bets one gold more, 36 gold. Black Flame smiles, as he called himself an elite of a major guild, yet he dares to increase the bid by one gold. He increased the bet by 40 gold, which shocks Frenzied, as that is a few years worth of salary. Isn't this bastard risking too much for a damn chest plate? But now that he thinks about it, this just shows the chest plate is an amazing treasure. It is worth far more than 40 gold, that is most definitely the case here. He slams his fist on the table and says that he will pay 50 gold. Swan thinks that he is insane, as 50 gold is the entire capital of the guild. Just what has he done? Seeing how much he increased the price, Black Flame surrenders the item to him and even claps to congratulate him. Frenzied relishes in his victory and continues to mock Black Flame again and again. What happened to his funds? Did Daddy not give him enough pocket money? What a loser. Seeing that nobody will bid any longer, the auction employee notes that the West Wind chest plate with a rare skin belongs to Frenzied Blade. Frenzied continues to laugh, but reality hits him. West Wind chest plate? That this is a West Wind chest plate only worth one damn silver coin? The auction employee calmly explains that this is a West Wing breastplate with a rather rare skin. Even though it does not change its stats, it looks a lot cooler and makes the player suave. While Frenzied has a heart attack over spending 50 gold on a damn vanity piece, the auction employee notes that they will contact his guild with the payment within 24 hours. Should payment not be made, the guild will be severely punished by the system. Everyone now looks at Black Flame in a different light, as he destroyed one of the major guilds without even lifting a finger. Truly, the demon hunter is also a demon himself. Thank you for watching. See you next time.